Ah, test e i. Test per... Guardiamo un attimo, qui l'audio ti dovrebbe... E il cavo era vostro che l'ho passato ora... Ah, detto... ah, ok. Ah, no, te sei. Ok. Ok, mentre te mi avevi chiesto l'audio... E te mi avevi chiesto un audio... E, e, prova, prova, sa. Prova microfono, 4, 5, 6. Prova. Mi sembra più basso di ieri, ma può ah, sì, ora sto parlando, sto parlando piano io, quindi... Prova, e... Devo, devo, questo lo devo un pochino abbassare. E, prova, perché se uno fa... Ecco qua, prova, e... E, prova... Ok, reccatemi un altro po', vai. Ok, e comunque se ce la facciamo da tutti archetti, abbiamo vinto, bravo, bravo. E sa. Ok, sorry. Ok, test 1, test 2, test perfect, ok.
delle scienze che metti il blocco del pulsante perché se loro fanno una domanda a volte fanno così e lo spazio per fare una domanda e non si sente invece una volta in legge non si sente
Please take your seat. We will start shortly. Please take your seat. We will sh start shortly. Thank you. Buongiorno, benvenuti a State of the Union. Vi prego di accomodarvi perché la conferenza sta per iniziare. Grazie. You want to say it in Italian? I can say no, it in English. You can say it in English. They will understand. Please take your seat. We will start shortly. Thank you.
Table. Table Star. so much and a very good morning to you all buongiorno a tutti welcome to florence welcome to the stunning palazzo vecchio to the 13th edition of the annual state of the union conference it's the second day of course of this annual conference this reflective high level event about the european union brought to you by the european university institute a warm welcome to all of you though, also joining us today online on the website. If you want to get in touch with us, you can do so using socials and the hashtag is SOU2023. My name is Maeve McMahon, I'm a journalist with Euronews and I'm delighted to be with you today for an action-packed agenda, taking a look at how to build Europe during these tricky, shaky times of uncertainty. Throughout the day, we'll have high-level MEPs, academics, foreign ministers coming up on stage, answering serious questions about whether Europe is on the right track when it comes to foreign policy, economic policy, and climate targets. 
But first, I would like to welcome our hosts, starting with the Mayor of Florence, Dario Nadella. Grazie. Caro Commissario Borrell, alte rappresentanze dell'Unione Europea, signori ministri, signor Presidente della Regione, autorità, ospiti, signore e signori, è un grande piacere, un'emozione dare il benvenuto qui a Palazzo Vecchio a tutti gli ospiti di questo State of the Union promosso dall'Istituto Universitario Europeo per cui vorrei ringraziare anzitutto il Presidente René Deus che è qui. È un onore vivere questo appuntamento annuale. So welcome to Palazzo Vecchio for this second day of the State of the Union event, whose very appropriate theme for 2023 is Building Europe in Times of Uncertainty. Yesterday, we had the opportunity to listen to many important speeches, among them those of the Italian Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs, Antonio Tajani, of the Spanish First Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Economic Affairs and Digitalization, as well as of experts and professors. Each one has helped us to shed light on the difficult moment we are collectively going through the times of uncertainty mentioned earlier. First, the pandemic, followed the latter by the Russian invasion of Ukraine, have elicited a strong response from Europe, forced by these two cities. Europe crisis. Europe has been able to react in a united way showing cohesion to a degree that friends and adversaries alike could not have previously imagined following years of divisions and fragmentation culminating in the Brexit process. This is not only positive, but welcome. Europe, though, should not show its unity only in times of emergency. We need now to show even more solidarity, cohesion, courage, wisdom, and imagination as we confront new and existing challenges. I'm making reference to the environmental crisis and to the necessity to guarantee an effective and sustainable green transition, to the preservation and the strengthening of the welfare state, to development of a common foreign and defense policy, without which Europe will never be a complete and viable political player at international level. I have the impression that uh, populist movements fermented by identity politics around the world are increasing in Europe, too. This is because the European Union seems to be distant from its citizens and to lack the courage and imagination moving forward. That vision that inspired the founding fathers of European unity. Statesmen like Jean Monnet, Robert Schuman, Altero Spinelli, Alcide De Gasperi. It's not only the use of vetoes by national governments, by all the EU governments, each one in different matters, but also the weight of the bureaucratic apparatus. In the 27 states, as well as in Brussels, maybe especially in Brussels, which has caused disaffection and even alienation toward Europe and the ideals of European construction. That's why we need more politic. There are certainly solutions if there is the desire to change the status quo. I am convinced that one of the most significant is listening to the voices of cities, the voice of the people living in urban areas and to involve them in the resolution of the most pressing and complex issues of our time, energy, green and digital transitions, environmental policies, and implementation of a next generation EU to start. Cities are, have always been the stronghold of European culture and the European ideals, but they have no say in Strasbourg or Brussels. We need to remedy this situa situation. 
I believe it's high time to create in the European Parliament a committee that deals with the cities and urban policies. It is a high time to establish in Brussels, in the offices of the Commission, a secretariat specially dedicated to metropolitan areas. It's high time to set aside dedicated and direct European funds aimed at the development of metropolitan areas, taking inspiration from Pond Metro, a very positive example of our country. We need to realize that it's cities that have to face the most difficult challenges. Immigrants and their integration, environment protection, sustainable development, as well as the social inequalities. Since they have to deal with them every day at a practical level, cities are aware of the sites of the task of end, at end. They know from experience that only unity and cohesion in vision and action will provide hope in dealing with the current and, culture and future challenges effectively. Therefore, the ideals of Monet, Schumann, Spinelli, and De Gasperi, their highest aspirations, live on now in European cities. Let's give these cities the possibility to express them to their fullest potential. Thank you very much. Thank you to European University, and welcome to Florence. Grazie mille, Mayor of Florence there, Dario Nardella, for setting the scene, very frankly, for today's high-level discussion. So thank you so much for that, and thank you again for having us here in your beautiful city. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to welcome up here on stage Eugenio Gianni. That's the president, of course, of the Tuscany region. Put your hands together. Grazie di cuore a Dario Nardella come sindaco di Firenze per questa bellissima ospitalità e il ruolo che l'amministrazione comunale ormai da anni riesce ad esercitare per lo svolgimento di questo momento di State of Union che onorano tutta la regione toscana. E grazie al Presidente della Università Europea per il ruolo di coordinamento, di stimolo che quest'anno porta sempre più a vivere questi giorni fino alla Festa dell'Europa, il 9 di maggio, con tanti appuntamenti, tanti momenti di approfondimento. È un crescendo anno dopo anno per il valore e il coinvolgimento con queste giornate portano eh, tutta la Toscana a essere in qualche modo protagonista di quello che sono i processi necessari per un'integrazione e una coesione europea sempre più forte. Oggi siamo onorati della presenza dell'Alto Commissario Joseph Borrell. Devo dire che riflettevo mh, sulle parole di Dario nel momento in cui siamo qui nel Palazzo Vecchio che eh, poco più di 700 anni fa iniziò la sua costruzione in un momento in cui esattamente 570 anni fa eh, si varavano a Firenze, eh, 700, eh, 70 anni fa si varavano a Firenze gli ordinamenti di giustizia di Giano della Bella, che erano la francazione dall'epoca feudale e si costruiva il Palazzo Vecchio proprio nell'epoca di Dante, proprio nell'epoca in cui anche ieri veniva fatto riferimento il sommo poeta, il grande italiano che ci ha dato la lingua nella sua Divina Commedia dai primi tratti di quello che vuole essere l'identità europea. E siamo nel Salone dei Cinquecento, dove per sei anni si è riunito il Parlamento d'Italia, ai tempi di Firenze, capitale d'Italia, nella genesi del costituirsi l'unità italiana. Per sei anni questa è stata la Montecitorio nel nostro Paese. E coloro che erano i padri fondatori della nuova Italia che eh, metteva insieme otto stati preunitari. Eh, vediamo eh, Mazzini, forse più degli altri il teorico e il padre del risorgimento, che passava dallo scrivere sulla giovane Italia a scrivere sulla giovane Europa. Tanto è il senso che in questa realtà, quella fiorentina e toscana, l'Europa è stata sempre un punto di riferimento nei secoli per quell'affermazione di valori, di principi, eh, di aspirazione che oggi si concretizza in un momento drammatico 
quella, eh, quello con cui vediamo eh, l'oppressione e la brutalità russa invadere i confini dell'Ucraina, ma che eh, più di ogni altro forse ci dà il senso dell'importanza dell'identità europea. E in questo anno drammatico di guerra, indubbiamente la generazione Erasmus, dai libri e dallo studio, eh, ha colto ancora di più il senso del costruire un'identità europea che è già in noi e con noi. Lo è perché le normative ormai sono quelle europee a cui ispiriamo il nostro vivere civile, le risorse, guardate una regione come la Toscana, significano solo per il piano nazionale di ripresa e resilienza 6 miliardi e 600 milioni, pari a... Eh, 6.120 progetti già certificati e che partiranno, eh, è questo il check-up del 31 di marzo, e con i fondi strutturali europei, il FESRE, il Fondo Europeo per lo Sviluppo Regionale, l'FSE, il Fondo Sociale Europeo, il Fondo delle Regioni Marittime, il Fondo per l'Agricoltura in Europa, altri 3 miliardi e 300 milioni nei prossimi sei anni. Insomma, la Toscana vive dei progetti che si collocano in quei quasi 10 miliardi che saranno vita e volano per la nostra economia, per la nostra società, per i livelli di inclusione e coesione in cui noi aspiriamo. Quindi parlare in questi cinque giorni di Europa significa concretamente indurre a quello che è la vita delle nostre comunità che sull'Europa costruiscono il proprio futuro perché poi nella scena globale e mondiale è evidente che Stati Uniti, Cina, India, Russia, Europa non andremo da nessuna parte attraverso i nostri 27 stati nazionali. La nostra identità si costruisce sui giovani, si costruisce nel confronto e nell'approfondimento delle questioni e è quello che accadrà in questi quattro giorni fino al 9 di maggio, il giorno in cui eh, vivremo ciò che è il momento importante di un'Europa che si è costituita e che a Firenze ha offerto questa grande opportunità ormai da 50 anni che è l'Università Europea. La sua convenzione costitutiva parlava con Giorgio Lapira e con Amintore Fanfani. Eh, il suo eh, svolgersi è dal 1975-1976. Ecco, L'Università Europea costituisce in qualche modo il perno e l'espressione più chiara del ruolo della Toscana in Europa e questi giorni non a caso ne sanciscono il suo significato e la sua forza. Grazie a tutti. Grazie mille, Presidente Gianni, there for outlining all the issues there and stressing the role that the Tuscan region has, of course, in Europe and the European Union as we, of course, approach Europe Day, which is next uh, Tuesday. But now, ladies and gentlemen, it is time to invite up here on stage the President of the European University Institute. That's, of course, Reno Deus. Ladies and gentlemen, I already had the pleasure yesterday of explaining how important it was for an institution such as the EUI to reach out to uh, a whole uh, range of interlocutors uh, from uh, policy makers to civil society representatives. I won't repeat this, be reassured. I want to simply stress today how important it is in this kind of initiative to have strong uh, partnership uh, with the, let's say, the territory in which uh, we are embedded. And I must say that in that respect, I could not dream of a better partnership than the one we have with the city of Florence for the organization of this event. It enables us to be hosted uh, every year in this wonderful room, which of course has a great symbolic value. I mean, the, monumental character of the place is due to the fact that it was designed to host assemblies of uh, Florentine citizens who were to debate uh, the most pressing issues of the Republic. It's therefore only appropriate that it is now used to gather assemblies of European citizens and others uh, who have together to discuss 
the most pressing issues of our time. So thank you very much to the city of Florence uh, and its mayor, Daniel, Dario Nardella, for uh, assisting us in this endeavor. Um, and uh, let, let me end simply by a special word of thank for, uh, well, a very close friend of our institute, our former president, Jose Borrell, who once more has found a time in uh, what everybody knows is an extremely busy agenda for a stopover in Florence. We are extremely uh, grateful for that and very much look forward to what he has to tell us now. I wish you all a very pleasant day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Deus, for that very short and sweet uh, speech to kick us off again. I believe our musicians uh, will now leave, so thank you so much to you. And a warm welcome again to those of you joining us online for this 13th edition of the State of the Union high-level annual conference. If you're using social media today, do use that hashtag SOU2023. But now, as promised, as Mr. Dehus just said, it's time to delve into the major challenges facing the world today and the role, in fact, that the European Union needs to play, whether it's in Ukraine or Sudan, living in these uncertain times and the responsibilities that the European Union has and the man fronting the European Union on the world stage and also trying to keep the 27 united is, of course, Joseph Borré, whose name was mentioned already. That's the high representative of the European Union for Foreign Affairs, and he's the Vice President as well of the European Commission. And we're delighted to have him here today physically with us in Florence, and I'd like to invite you now up on stage to take a seat beside me, Mr. Borré. Money. Welcome. Thank you. Take a seat. Have a seat. Busy agenda for you. Very busy days for you. I'm uh, very... Not today. Today is a day to reflect. <laughs> and as we heard this morning, what better place to reflect than in this beautiful room in the Palazzo Vecchio? And Mr. Borre, it's been one year since we sat here together on this same stage in Florence. The world perhaps no safer than it was this time last year. How has the year been for the European Union and how has the year been for you? Well, this has been a, a difficult year, certainly marked by the war. Suddenly the war is at our borders. And we have been very busy trying to support Ukraine. But at the same time, this year we have seen the emergency of China as a big power, an assertive power. And we have seen the fragmentation of the world. And many other countries, big countries, populated, growing quickly, and not willing to take side on the Ukrainian war. Yes, voting in the United Nations against the invasion, but uh, politically sending message that shows that there is a, a feeling of, uh, well, this is not our war. It is going to be very bad for us on directly high prices of electricity, high prices of energy and food. So I think that uh, for us Europeans, this year has been the year of uh, taking stock of a much complex reality, a fragmented world with a big clash between the two superpowers, US and China. And once again, the real dramatic reality of a war in our borders that cost a lot to, in terms of uh, money to us and to the Ukrainians in terms of lives. And do you feel like you've become uh, somewhat a war diplomat? Uh, do you feel like you're prioritizing Ukraine a lot and sometimes perhaps you might not have time for other issues? Well, more than diplomacy, well, we are doing diplomacy, but in Ukraine, unhappily, unhappily, this is not the moment for diplomatic conversations about peace. It's the moment of supporting military the war. 
So I feel uh, as a diplomat, but I feel also as a, as a kind of a defense minister of the European Union, because I spend quite an important part of my time talking about arms and munitions. I never thought that I was going to to spend so much time thinking about how many shots of artillery can I provide, can we Europeans provide to the Ukrainians, for example. Indeed, this time last year we spoke a lot about sanctions. The focus of the EU was sanctions and more sanctions. Now, as you say, it's more focused on defense. Do you feel when you're meeting behind closed doors with ministers, do you feel like the EU is in, is in war mode? Well, the war has united us. There is nothing that can unite you more than an enemy, a threat. And the feeling of facing a threat, a real existential threat, has united us more than any, any speech, any theoretical approach about the need of integration. And it has united also the, the, the West, the transatlantic relationship has never been stronger like today. Really? Yes. Well, with President Biden. Maybe with President uh, Trump, things would have been different. But uh, today, yes, in front of the war in Ukraine, the, the West, meaning by the West, the transatlantic people, Canada, United Kingdom, US, Europeans, have shown a, a remarkable unity. And I think that one of the mistakes of uh, P Putin was to think that uh, un the Europeans would not be united because of the energy dependency, for example, and that the public opinions in Europe would get tired of supporting Ukrainians, and that the US and Europe would have a quarreling about uh, who does what and which share the burden. This is not the case. And we saw this week um, President Zelensky of Ukraine traveling to Finland. He was also in the Netherlands. He was in The Hague. Do you think that Europeans are still concerned about the war in Ukraine? Do you think it's still on their minds? Europeans. Europeans are a lot of people. It depends. Voters. Let's say voters. Or citizens. <laughs> Look, it's not the same thing uh, in Florence that in Vilnius. It's not the same thing in the south of Europe that in the Baltics. The Baltics are in the front line and they have a, a sincere feeling that uh, if Ukraine falls, they will be the next. For them, it's an existential threat. If you live in Sevilla, if you live uh, in, in the other border, the other end of Europe, you don't have the same perception. But if you look at the polls, the great majority of the Europeans agree on supporting Ukraine. And what about Moldova and Georgia? Are you worried about what could happen there? Uh, well, you go to Moldova and we will go to Moldova. Everybody, everybody will go to Moldova because in Moldova it will be taking place uh, the conference on the political community of Europe, whatever it is. No? You have to discover exactly what does it mean. But there will be more than 40 countries meeting in Moldova in some weeks. Moldova is another example. It's still worse than the Baltics. Remember that inside Moldova, there are several thousand of Russian troops in Transnistria. Remember that Moldova is critically dependent for electricity and gas from Russia. And from Moldova, you hear, you hear the, the guns. So for them, the, the idea that uh, it, our security is in danger, their security is in danger, is very much clear. Joseph Barry, the big, weeks in, the big news in Brussels there was the 500 million euro Ammunition Production Act, just announced by the European Commission, also known as ASAP. How big a deal is this? Do you think it could be a game changer, this plan? No. A game changer? No, you know, we're talking about uh, a small amount of money. We're talking about 500 million euros. Well, I know that saying that this is a small amount of money, 500 million euros, looks a little bit uh, uh, weird, but to the scale of the problem, it's not going to be a game changer. But it's a, 
a signal that Europe has to increase its defense capabilities. And the defense capabilities starts by the industrial capabilities. Our industry is, is uh, at a very, very low level from the point of view of the capacity of production. For a peace situation, that's okay. But for a war, no. So we have to ramp up, we have to increase this capacity. And this uh, munition act will not uh, really change dramatically the situation because the European Union budget cannot be used to buy arms. But we're not talking about buying arms, I'm talking about increasing the industrial capacity of the industry of defense, which is something different. As you say, there are not a lot of money, those 500 million euros. And I understand the plan is to take some money from EU cohesion funds and recovery funds for this fund, money that was actually meant to be used to revamp our economies post-COVID. Do you think people are on board with supporting this investment in arms and they wouldn't worry that we're funding a war instead of a recovery? You know, everybody prefers butter to the guns. Me, the first. But I think that the, 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 the people who are in charge, parliamentarians, high-level politicians, at the national level, at the European level, have to send a message. We didn't want this war. We were not looking for it. But the war is a reality and you have to face it. And everybody wants peace, yes, but the time being, unhappily, Putin is continuing the war. And Ukraine has to defend. And if we don't support Ukraine, Ukraine will fall in a matter of days. So yes, I would prefer to spend this money increasing the, the well-being of the people, hospitals, schools, the cities, as the mayor is asking for. But uh, we don't have the choice. We don't have the choice. Any message today for Vladimir Putin, the Russian president? What would be your message to Vladimir Putin? Well, the only message that the international community and certainly the Europeans are sending is stop this war. Stop this war. Stop bombing Ukraine. Withdraw your troops. I know he's not going to do it. But every time I, I listen to some world leader saying, I want peace. Yes, okay, if you want peace, push Russia to withdraw. Push Russia to stop the war. Don't tell me I stop supporting Ukraine. Because if I stop supporting Ukraine, certainly the war will finish soon. But how? How the war will finish? It doesn't matter? Yes, it matters. It is the most important thing. The war cannot just finish because Ukraine is unable to defend itself and it has to surrender and the Russian troops will be on the Polish border and Ukraine will become a second Belarus. Do you want this kind of ending the war? No. Well, as we're sitting here in Florence, the situation on the ground does not look good. Um, have you anything to say? What's your assessment on the efforts to find a uh, so I don't understand. I was just saying, as we're sitting here today in Florence, the situation on the ground does not look good. Do you see any workable peace plan on the table to stop the war? The only thing that could be called peace plan is the Zelensky's proposal. Because the Chinese peace plan, well, it's not a peace plan. It's a set of uh, uh, wishful consideration, wishful thinkings, but it's not a peace plan. The only one is the one that has been proposed by the Ukrainians, but certainly it will not be accepted by the Russians. But let's face the reality like it or not. The reality is Putin continues saying, I have military objectives, and as far as I don't get these military objectives, I will continue fighting. So the peace plans are good, but you need someone that wants to talk about peace, really. 
if, if, you, if you found someone who says, I have military objectives and I will continue bombing, I will continue fighting until I got them, well, what kind of a peace talk do you want to do? And what about the Chinese head of state, Xi? He had a phone call with President Zelensky. Did you find that phone call reassuring? Do you think they can play a role as a peacemaker? Since the beginning, I said China has a role to play. And then it was uh, strongly criticized because certainly China is on the side of Russia. But even if there is in the side of Russia, I think China has a role to play. China is a permanent member of the Security Council. China is, is the one who has the biggest influence in Russia. China has not provided arms to Russia until now. The US were considering this possibility. This has not happened until now. And the fact that uh, President Xi talked with President Zelensky, well, even if he didn't mention war, but they talk, is a good thing. And certainly, we, have, uh, we are very much interested in not pushing Russia on the side of China too much. And on China, you had a visit planned to Beijing recently, but you caught COVID. Uh, yes, <laughs> I got COVID, and maybe it was not so bad, because Pekin was crowded with Europeans. There were so many that uh, maybe it was not the good moment to go. I will go. It was a blessing in disguise, perhaps. Indeed, it was, it was an interesting time because Emmanuel Macron, the French president, was there. He brought along the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen. What would your stance be vis-a-vis -vis China? How can you find a stance regarding China that pleases everyone? Well, yes, Macron was there, President von der Leyen was there, and the Spanish Prime Minister, many others. And, and, and it shows something. It shows the role of China, the growth of China in the international arena. It shows that China has influence on Russia. Pekin is the place to go, <laughs> certainly. And I understand that the Europeans were criticized by a, a certain cacophony, saying different things. Well, in fact, they were not so different. The problem is that uh, in the political speech, people look at a, a word, a sentence, and they criticize strongly the word and the sentence out of the context. There is not an effort to try to understand what they wanted to say. For example, when President Macron said, uh, and he was strongly criticized for that, that the European Union may become a vassal of the US. Well, you have to understand what President Macron wanted to say. And I think that he wanted to say that uh, an alliance needs a balance between the members of the alliance. If the alliance is too unbalanced, then there is not an alliance. And we have to take care to keep our capacities, to keep our, the word strategy, autonomous, looks uh, polemic, but at the end, I think that, yes, we Europeans, we have to have our own way of facing China. On the EU-US-China triangle, we are closer to Washington, certainly. But we have to have our own way, and we are working on that. One of the most important things I am doing now is to prepare a report for the next European Union Council to present our view on China. Because China certainly is a partner, <laughs> how not? Is a competitor, yes, it's a competitor, but the, the U.S. is also a competitor, economically speaking. And it's a rival, but what kind of a rival? Is China a threat to the national security of the Europeans, like Russia? In Versailles, the head of state said Russia is a threat to our national security. We have never said that about China. 
And I think we, don't, we should not be against the race of China. China will become a great power, like it or not. The important thing is how China will manage its power. And what about Europe? Because this event, of course, it's all about Europe. It's all about the European Union as a potential power. And the language of power is your signature phrase. How are we doing? I mean, are we taken seriously on the world stage? Well, yes, I, I suppose this sentence will, <laughs> will mark my, my term. Europeans have to learn to use the language of power. But there are many kinds of power. Power is not just military power. It's not just uh, sending troops and occupying territories. But look, now, at that moment, in Port Sudan, in the south of Sudan, there are European warships taking out to Sudan about 200 European citizens. This is a way of showing power. And on Sudan, what more can the EU do and the international community to stop the it's conflict very little, there? It's very little what we can do in Sudan. It's a civil war between the two, two generals with two armies. Nobody will intervene militarily in Sudan. In Sudan, the only way of acting is trying to get a ceasefire among them uh, through international pressure. And the Europeans, we are one among others. We don't have a surplus of power, but we have certain powers. And the more united we are, the bigger this power will be. And this is, for me, the, the, the lesson learned in front of a war, in front of the electricity prices going up. We need more unity. In the world in which we live, we Europeans, we are too small. If we want to survive, we have to be more united. We have to abandon the unanimity vote on foreign policy. Well, that was my next question, because nine countries also agree with you, including France and Germany. A letter was sent this week on this very point putting an end to unanimity. Will that ever fly? Well, the problem with abandoning unanimity is that it requires unanimity. <laughs> you need unanimity to abandon unanimity. Uh, Hence my question, will it ever fly? I mean... Well, <laughs> I know it's difficult because everybody wants to keep the veto right, because unanimity means each one has the veto right. Unanimity means that uh, if I don't like it, I block it until I get something else. For example, we have been discussing for months about the Cotonou Agreement, and there are blockages for one, two countries, discussing things that has nothing to do with the issue we are discussing, but blocking point A is a way of getting some rewards on point B, which has nothing to do with point A. Well, this is not the way we, we could work in a world that uh, runs very quickly, where there are big states. China is a state, the US is a state, India is a state. We are not a state. We are a club of states. And we have to have rules that make us able to decide quicker. Because now, of course, there's talks on another package of sanctions against Sorry? Russia. There's talk now among the EU member states about more sanctions. But I just wanted to ask you, do you think the focus is more on defense now because there's a feeling that the sanctions were not as effective as they could have been, or they didn't work as fast, perhaps, as they could have? The sanctions. Look, the other day, it was, uh, the other day it's, uh, three days ago, it was in Latin America. And he was talking with a president of a great Latin American country. And he told me, look, you are doing with Russia, with your sanctions, the same thing that the uh, Allies in, two, in 1919 did with Germany. And, and I told him, look, I don't understand which is the, the comparison. Germany had to face Mm, war reparations that certainly were disproportionate and pushed for the Second World War. But our sanctions to Russia 
has nothing to do with that. We call sanctions, and in fact, the word sanctions doesn't exist on the European Treaty. You go to the European Treaty and you look for sanctions, the word sanction doesn't exist. It's only restrictive measures. Which are the restrictive measures? So, I don't... I, so do they work, restrictive yes, measures? Yes, they work. Certainly they work. Okay. Certainly they work, but they are not in, in, instantaneous. Is it, is, is it like a diet? You want to go in a diet? You're not going to lose uh, 30 kilos in one week. And nobody's going on a diet in Florence. Um, <laughs> Joseph Bure, one more question. You have one year left. Of course, here we're all talking about the European elections next May or June. We're still waiting for the date to be confirmed. What would you like to achieve in that last year? A just peace in Ukraine. A just peace in Ukraine. It's the most difficult endeavor. But certainly, this is the thing that matters more today for us. A just peace in Ukraine. And if I could say a second one, is a better understanding with the rest, because there is the West and the rest, a better understanding with them to try to prove that them really matters for us, that we are not only engaged with Ukraine, that um, we are able to face their complaints, their resentment, and to make them understand that uh, Europe is, uh, is no longer an imperial or colonial power. It belongs to the past, but is clear a, a force of peace in order to face the global challenges. And the global challenges is not only climate, it's the depth and it's development to work m more with them, because we still have a too much Eurocentric approach to the rest of the world. Okay. Joseph Borre, thank you so much for speaking to us here at the State of the Union in Florence. A round of applause for the High Representative. Thank you. It's very moving to see at a fantastic place. Our clock is showing one minute. I don't know if there's one question from the audience, perhaps, before you take your seat. Questions from the audience. This is a difficult no? moment. OK. Well, then, thank you so much for speaking to thank me. You. Take care. Enjoy your day in Florence. Thank you. Bye bye. The, the, the acoustics the, are not great, I know. Okay. Thank you. Thank take you. care. So I think everyone needs another coffee if there's no more questions from, from the audience at this point. But don't go anywhere because it's not time for a coffee break just yet. In fact, we will stick to that topic of EU foreign policy, but we'll be bringing in more voices and more perspectives. So I'm delighted to welcome now up on stage uh, Mr. Arnaud Dangien. That's, of course, the French MEP and the chair of the European Parliament Subcommittee on Security and Defence. And we're also welcomed by Norbert Röttgen, that's the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee at the German Bundestag. So we'll be getting you both a chair up here, gentlemen. We'll get you a chair. Great. Hi. Welcome. Pleasure. Lovely to see you. How are you? Welcome. Bonjour. Welcome. Take a seat. Wherever you feel comfortable. And you can have some water as we just get ready. Okay. So, so if everyone would like to take their seats, please, and we can kick off with this next session, which again is about the future of European foreign policy. Welcome as well to those joining us online today. All our sessions will also be available later to tune into. So as I said here, we're joined by the French MEP Arnaud Dangien and Robert Rutkin. You're very um, active on Twitter. I like to follow your tweets all the time. And you're just back from the United States, I believe. So we'll, we'll hear about that a little bit later. Um, but first, I'm just waiting for any reaction to what you've heard so far from the EU Foreign Affairs Chief, from Mr. Joseph Borre this morning? Well, 
I'm quite used to listen to the High Representative Borrell as an MEP. I must say, I very much share his view that we as European, um, of course, are focusing, that's quite legitimate, on the war in Ukraine, and it will shape our geopolitical landscape for months and probably years to come, whatever the outcome is. But we should not forget the rest of the world. Uh, we have immense challenges in the South. I would not say the global South. I do not like this expression because the South is very diverse. But we have huge challenges, security challenges, uh, just on the other side of the Mediterranean. We are in Italy. People here are well aware that Northern Africa is not a very stable place. Middle East is full of challenges. Uh, the whole of Africa uh, is far from being quiet. So we must not forget that we Europeans, we have also a role to play in these regions. Um, and secondly, I also very much share what uh, Joseph Borrell said about um, the perception, the perception from the others about the war in Ukraine. For us, it's a top priority. And once again, it's perfectly legitimate and logical. In the rest of the world, this is not the perception. I've been traveling extensively to Africa, Middle East. Uh, people understand our concern. They understand that we pay attention first to Ukraine, but they have a different perception about their own interests and their own priorities. So we must not think that everybody thinks the same. And this has to lead us to a, a very uh, proactive foreign policy to try to convince the other that what is at stake is also in their interest. But also sometimes we have to not to lecture the others too much, especially as a parliamentarian dealing with foreign affairs. I can see that the European Parliament is very keen on lecturing the whole world about how to behave. Um, this is not exactly how it goes in the real life. So we should pay attention to that. Of course, we should stay firm on, on our priorities, but pay attention to the perception of the others. So the European Parliament in Strasbourg perhaps has become a large lecturing theatre and a, a talking shop of people discussing and sharing opinions, but too inward looking. Would you agree perhaps with that assessment? Yes, of course, and I think we have to do it on both levels, on the European and the nation state level. Uh, it's a common challenge, and as horrible as this war is, there is an opportunity, I would say, only seized to some degree and wasted to a lot. This would be the creation of a European momentum to stand up against, or to, to stand up against the war by massively, significantly supporting Ukraine. And I would say we have not seized the opportunity so far. We would have, been, we would have to be much uh, more substantial in our efforts, much quicker in our efforts. Uh, and on the contrary, we have produced widespread fundamental disappointment across the Middle and uh, Eastern, Central and Eastern European countries and in the Baltic states. And perhaps, and not perhaps, we, in any case, we should try to rectify that and bring East and West together on the level of the nation state and the European Parliament. So how, how do you do such a thing? How do you rectify this? And would you agree with what um, the EU Foreign Affairs Chief said earlier that the EU, he believes, is still very much united? Sorry, the... Is the EU, do you think, still very much united? I think so, yes. So far, so good. Uh, so far, so good. And I think uh, we cannot underestimate uh, the cohesion that has taken place uh, since a year now. Um, but in, indeed, uh, we must also be very uh, careful uh, about this cohesion. We have seen some signs coming from different countries um, that the solidarity um, sometimes can be broken. Um, I think also we are challenged from inside 
the, the, the foreign policy is shaped by national government. Had the majority in some countries been different, maybe the European solidarity would have been affected. In my own country, France, there are a lot of political forces which are having a different agenda. Uh, so uh, we must be cautious. It's not a done deal. So far, so good, but not a done deal. Okay. What would you say to that, Mr. Rodkin? And of course, national governments, as you know, they have to put themselves first. I would say it very much depends on the perspective. If you compare our unity today with the unity before the war, yes, it's good. If you compare it from an internal perspective, it's good. But if you, comp if you measure it by what is necessary to preserve and to restore European security, it's totally insufficient. And it's, we are lucky, but at the same time, it's embarrassing that again, it's not the Europeans, but the United States, which has emerged again as the European security power. And there are deep divides on what is necessary uh, to do on U European security between the East and the West. And as I mentioned earlier, we have not succeeded in bringing East and West together. And so below the surface of a seemingly remarkable unity, there are deep divides and I'm worried about the sustainability and the cohesion in the medium and long term. And you were just in the United States, you were just in Washington. What was the mood like on that? Of course, so to, to sum it up, I would say that the clock is ticking. The United States, as I mentioned, has become again the European security power uh, and we couldn't wish for a more uh, cooperative alliance-oriented American administration. But of course, if we were to see Donald Trump or uh, Ron DeSantis as Republican candidate, they, there is no doubt that they will attack this uh, administration just because they have been committed and engaged so heavily in Ukraine. And also the left wing of the Democratic Party is um, quite silently, but you can hear it, questioning the degree of engagement. And so there might be, uh, there, there will be a, a debate on this. It will be challenged in the campaign. And the degree of success or uh, the lack of success of the counter-offensive will also reverberate in the sustainability of the support. Uh, so I would say in any case, even in the best case scenario, the United States is not going to stay forever, for a long, long time, uh, uh, investing such high uh, amounts of money to Europe. Uh, it, the, the, the clock is ticking that the Americans will ask the Europeans to, to bear a higher share of burden. And it's our interest, because it's our Europe, uh, to provide more for European security and not to rely on the United States of America. We have made our experiences and we should take it in our hands. And this is just the challenge uh, which, is, which is not yet uh, resolved by Europeans. Okay, the clock very much ticking. As I mentioned, we have elections as well next spring. They will be a big distraction, take a lot of time as well. I'd like to hear what you think about this ammunition plan of the European Commission. As Joseph Borre said, it's just 500 million, it's not enough, but can you see finance ministers putting their hands in their pockets around the block to, to fund this? Well, first, let me tell you that this is something uh, whatever the problems we face uh, currently to put that in place, we, we, we face some technical issues, but uh, it is quite remarkable that Europe has managed so far to try to set up such kind of programs. If we had talked in the European campaign a few months or a few years ago about having such program of buying together ammunition for billions of euros, I think we nobody would have believed that. So, uh, it's work in progress. Of course, it's always slow and, and too slow, but I'm quite optimistic that it will take place. Uh, having said that, um, what we have to make sure is that this effort 
is not reversible. Because I very much share the view of Norbert that in the field of defense, every time you make a progress due to the circumstances under external pressure, it can be reversed in the mid and long run. And a lot of people within European institutions, within our countries, uh, see that effort as a one-shot effort. We have to make sure that it is a sustained effort because we will need that robust effort in defense for years to come. That's my main concern. I mean, the technical issues that we face now to put that in place will be overcome, I'm sure. But we have to make it sure that it goes in the long run. In the long run. And sitting here on stage with a, a French politician and a German politician, we have to talk about the, the Franco-German alliance as well. I mean, it was so close for so many decades. How is it doing now? How are ties between Berlin and Paris? Sir Rudkin? <laughs> We have, seen, we have seen better times of German-French cooperation and it is not that we perhaps agreed more in the past but what we have forgotten now, the governments both I would say, is that we know about our differences both regarding views and fundamental attitudes but in the past we knew that we have to come to terms and achieve a compromise eventually and this is not the case today and so I would say at least we have to state a distorted communication, a lack of communication or no communication. And this, this is something we simply can't afford. And uh, this is not the responsibility we can expect from both governments. A lack of communication or even no communication. Would you agree with that assessment? Well, uh, both of us, Norbert and I, are opposition people in our, in our countries. So it's difficult to comment um, the policy of our government. I mean, I don't agree with many, many uh, orientations of, uh, of, our, of my government. And especially on the Franco-German, I think, I mean, the responsibilities are shared. Um, there, are, there are quite diverging views on many issues. Uh, it's also due to probably a lack of strategic consistency at home. Uh, both in France and Germany, we have to spell out what we want uh, clearly and more consistently. And sometimes I have the feeling that this uh, relationship is run by uh, uh, what we call in French petite phrase, small sentences, small words, and, and, and like, like we have in the Franco-Italian relationship, for example, over the last 24 hours, which is which yeah. is not at the level. It is not at the level. We, come, we should come back to more strategic thinking. And when we come back to more strategic thinking, I think we, we can find a lot of convergences. Okay, we have to get back to strategic thinking. And uh, Joseph Borre will have a challenge now at the upcoming EU summit when he presents that paper he mentioned on China. Uh, Mr. Rudkin, I'm curious to hear your take because I saw you were furious with the French President Emmanuel Macron. Um, so was I. So were you. <laughs> <laughs> so what should the bloc stance be vis-a-vis -vis China? Because as we've seen, it's impossible to find unity. I think what is really necessary vis-a-vis -vis China is to strike the balance between resilience uh, on the basis of the assessment that China is not only a, 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 a brutal dictatorship internally, but clearly has the ambition to change what we call the liberal international order and replace the principle of rule and rule of law by the principle of might. And this is a fundamental challenge. So this is a security matter, uh, a matter of interest, fundamental interest of order and order building. So this requires resilience for the case of conflict. And for example, the German industry so far is not in a resilient shape if the conflict or war on Ukraine were to occur. This would have devastating impact on the state and the well-being of the German economy. And on the other side, the balance is with cooperation. I think it's not... We can't deal with China uh, uh, only by relying on containment or by applying a, a Cold War rhetoric, as we can see in parts uh, of the American debate. So we have to uphold cooperation on the, for example, in order to tackle the common 
uh, the challenges on our common global goods, the protection of, of, of our planet, biodiversity and climate, it's not that easy to avoid that this need for cooperation is not infected by the geopolitical struggle. So to have both sides a robust resilience and cooperation. This is what Europeans should strive for regarding China. Okay, robust resilience and cooperation. Brief comment from you on that. What would you say? No, very much agree with that. What prompted, what prompted such a, a big reaction to, to Macron's words was on Taiwan, specifically on Taiwan, because on Taiwan there is a broad consensus that we should stick to the statu quo. And any word from a Western leader uh, trying to diverge from that, I think, is a big mistake. So that's why I was so outraged by what uh, President Macron said. It was not that much on the substance of, of what, what should be done with China as a whole. We have uh, economic uh, uh, and trade relationships that will not vanish far from that. So we have to take that into account. In terms of foreign policies, uh, our interests are diverging. And in, indeed, the most, more assertive China is a challenge for us. So we have to deal with that in a realistic way. Uh, but what, what was really uh, problematic with Macron's speech is, uh, is that uh, uh, he, he diverged from, from, from the line on, on Taiwan, which is a, a shared and consensual one, keep the statu quo, and that's it. Okay. Unfortunately, President Macron is not here in the room to ask him. Perhaps he'll come next year to the State of the Union in Florence. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for that. I'm going to look around the room and see, is there anyone who would like to address you a question? We have a couple of seconds. We have a gentleman there at the front and just behind. If you just introduce yourselves, please, and make a brief question. Thank you so much. If we can oh, bring you a microphone. Yeah, there's a microphone coming to you. Philip Stevens. Um, hello, my name is Philip Stevens. I'm a visiting fellow at the STG here. Um, I wanted to ask our speakers about Europe's relationship with the global south, as it's often called. The Indian foreign minister famously remarked a few months ago that when Europe has a problem, it, it says it's, the problem, it's a problem for the world. But when the world has a problem, Europe isn't terribly interested. And we saw that with COVID, the refusal of the richest countries to act quickly to help the global south. And someone recently remarked that if you looked at the list of countries that impose sanctions against Russia and the list of countries, the first countries to get the COVID vaccine, those 40 countries are almost identical in both cases. And your question? The question is, what should Europe be doing to rebuild that relationship with the Global South? Wow. Thank you so much, sir. We have one more question behind you. Yeah. The microphone. Thank you very much. I'm uh, Karen Mulcair. I'm a member of the European Parliament. The two panelists mentioned that the European Parliament likes to lecture the rest of the world. Sometimes it feels like individual national politicians and ministers likes to do so as well. And when we have institutional leaders such as Joseph Borrell or Ursula von der Leyen or their predecessors, they also like to uh, say what Europe thinks, but it's often very weighted uh, according to national interests and not so much based on values. I see the work that the European Union's uh, Parliament is doing on protection of fundamental rights as very important and not a part of lecturing. We are able to actually stand up for the European Union's values. So who should be speaking for the protection of fundamental rights, human rights across okay. the world if the European okay. Parliament doesn't have this voice? It does it. Thank you so much for your questions there. We're being told we have to end, so I'm going to have to give you both 30 seconds to to tackle those questions. Okay. On Global South, I think I already touched upon it uh, yeah. in my previous remarks. Uh, I, think, I, I think it's a bit unfair on the COVID 
because uh, there, there was a problem on the patent, but, but when it comes to deliver aid in terms of COVID, uh, we did quite a lot, we Europeans. Um, uh, but uh, yes, indeed, I think we have to take into account uh, the concerns of some of the countries. We have also to understand that this Global South notion is very tricky because Global South is very diverse. And I would not put India and Brazil in the same basket, uh, even related to what is going on now in Ukraine. We need a whole other panel just, on that. Just on, just on lecturing, European Parliament is standing for, for human rights and, and European values all the time. So there is no question about that. My point was a foreign policy cannot rely only on this dimension. So it's fine that European Parliament is writing dozens of resolutions on human rights, fine. But diplomacy, security policy, foreign policy, it's not that alone. And when we talk to the southern countries, we have to take into account other dimensions. Otherwise, they will not listen to us, even when we have right things to say about human rights and values. Okay. Very interesting. Mr. Norbert Redken? Yes, I, I, I have my doubts whether the Global South exists as an entity, but of course I know what you mean. And I think belatedly we have to learn the lesson. If it's a part of uh, our, uh, our, has to be a part of our strategy, of the pursuit of our interest, that we engage with the world. And this was one reason why Macron was so wrong in his saying the Americans are trying to drag us into a conflict which is not our conflict. Also Taiwan would be our conflict. And we have also to identify, identify with the conflicts which are far away and we have to be open to this conflict. We have to rebuild the ties and the relationship which we left to a much too high degree to China and the others. So we have to learn Great. the lesson, very simple. Great. Gentlemen, thank, thank you. you so much for your time and thank You're you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Apologies there to have had to bring that to an end. That was a fascinating discussion there as well about foreign policy. Thank you so much to our audience and thank you for your questions. Um, now it's time to change topic completely uh, and focus on the energy crisis. And it's obviously been focusing minds as well here on reaching EU climate targets. To, to set the scene for this discussion, I would like to invite up on stage Frank Elderson. He's a member of the executive board and vice chair of the supervisory board at the European Central Bank. And he'll be talking about green financing, I believe. Yeah. Mr. Peabox. Hi, you'll be moderating. So for those who'd like to leave the room, please leave the room and the rest can sit down while we kick off with our next session. Thank you so much. Uh, so Christian, you are here. Yes. Yeah. Frank, uh, no? Yeah. I think I'm yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, I think we can Let's sit down. down. Yeah. So this session, ladies and gentlemen, will be moderated by Andrews Pibax. He's a professor here at the European University Institute, and he's also, of course, the former European Commissioner for Energy. I recognize you well from your time over in Brussels. And this session will be co-moderated by Marza Sassini, a research associate here at the European University Associate. So, oh, hello. Um, if you'd like to take it away. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Andres Piebalx. I am now a professor I mean, I at the European Union Institute. Uh, University Institute. I sometimes mix it up. Uh, together with my colleague Marcia Sessini, research assist, uh, associate at the European uh, University Institute, uh, we will be moderating this session. Uh, the session name is uh, rather uh, perhaps uh, for today, a bit more pessimistic because it's saying a silver lining from the energy crisis in question mark, strengthening the delivery at the uh, um, EU's net zero goal, citizen welfare and energy security in responding to the energy crisis. We definitely are in by far better shape when we, I, 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 I wrote this uh, 
name for the session. But uh, it does not mean that energy issues have moved away from the political agenda. Actually, they are increasing in importance. For 1.5 years, Europe has lived under the unprecedented uh, shock, uh, disruption of deliveries, price spikes, and uncertainty in the market. But most importantly, yeah. we have responded to the no, Russia's no, aggression no, to no, Ukraine. No, okay I just time? remind banning coal, oil, and oil products uh, that what has delivered okay, well, a lot of money to the yeah. war chest in Russia. So right. it's unprecedented so right decisions have been taken. Yeah, yeah. At the same time, we moved ahead with climate discussion. Yeah, yeah. We have moved away with protecting citizens and keeping the fundamentals of European market. So we can be very proud what Europe has done on energy area on the last one and a half years. So Europe did deliver well. But now we need to look for the next steps. And I have the best possible panels that I could imagine for this. We have Frank Elderson, member of the executive board and vice chair of the supervisory board uh, from the European Central Bank. His main focus has been, I would say, double. He is a central banker with long experience, but he put particular attention for climate issues and green financing. We have Ditte Jul Jorgensen, Director General for Energy European Commission with knowledge in trade competition, but most importantly, leading the way really to responding to the crisis. Congratulations, Ditte, to you and your team. We have Christian Bus uh, Silvio Busoy, Chair of uh, European Parliament's Industry, Research and Energy Committee, the crucial committee to get support for political driving our agenda. And we have uh, Marco Butti, now my colleague, uh, he is a chair of Economic and Monetary Integration, uh, Tommaso Padoglio Schipo, uh, chair of Economic and Monetary Integration at the European in University Institute. He also just uh, published a book, uh, Was Jean Monnet Right? Building Europe in Times of Crisis. But we know most of the time of him as a Director General for Economic and Financial Affairs of, in the European Commission, and recently really steering the way uh, as a Head of Cabinet for Commissioner for Energy, Paolo Gentiloni. So we build up with a presentation on, on green financing. Frank, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you, um, University Institute. Um, many thanks uh, for having me here and in an impressive lineup of speakers. As the cradle of the Renaissance, uh, Florence has a long history, of course, of attracting people from different disciplines around Europe. The most gifted individuals in the fields of art, science, politics and finance have long come to the city to make a difference, together unleashing creative forces of a magnitude greater than the sum of their already impressive individual contributions. And just, just as we have come today to the Palazzo Vecchio to unlock the creativity required to address the multi-dimensional challenges that are affecting the state of the European Union, my contribution will focus on the most pressing challenge requiring urgent action, the climate and environmental crises. The problem is clear. The state of the European Union is not yet on a transition path that is aligned with the goals of the Paris Agreement to pursue efforts to limit global warming to one and a half degrees Celsius above pre industrial levels, and in any case, well below 2 degrees Celsius. Linear trend extrapolation of global warming puts us going beyond 1.5 degrees in March 2035. Mind you, 
When country delegates negotiated the Paris Agreement in December 2015, the trend suggested that this level would not be breached until March 2045. So in other words, on top of the seven plus years that have since passed, we have lost another 10. Using a more sophisticated approach, the Climate Action Tracker, which was developed by a consortium of climate research organizations when compiled in November 2022, assessed that the policies and actions taken by the EU were almost sufficient to be consistent with limiting global warming to two degrees Celsius. The picture improves if the tracker incorporates policy commitments policy commitments made, but not yet implemented. However, even then, it is still not consistent with limiting global warming to one and a half degrees Celsius. For some existing commitments, the European Council recently endorsed several measures proposed by the European Commission. Nonetheless, more specific commitments are clearly required and all promises need to be kept. Importantly, under the Fit for 55 strategy, the EU is committed to lowering carbon emissions by at least 55% by 2030. Moreover, against the backdrop of Russia's horrific ongoing war against Ukraine, the EU has pledged to become independent from Russia fossil fuels well before 2030 under its Repower EU plan. The Commission estimates that reaching the Fit for 55 and Repower EU objectives requires an average annual investment of 1.25 trillion over the years 2021-2030. That estimate would add around 500 billion to the level of annual investment in climate and energy security um, seen in the previous decade. Most of this additional investment will need to come from the private sector as households and firms adjust to a net zero economy. However, significant shortcomings in the functioning of the, financial systems are in the, of the financial system are presently curtailing the flow of investment in green and therefore truly sustainable economic development. So let me talk a little bit about the gaps in finance. Most prominently, carbon pricing is still not being used to an adequate extent. Progress has been made. The carbon price in the EU's emission trading system has been rising since 2021. And the European Council and European Parliament recently agreed on extending the scheme's scope of application and on a mechanism to equalize the price of carbon between domestic products and imports. However, Overall emissions continue to be improperly priced, implying that economic activity, including the flow of finance, remains biased in favor of high emission activities. Besides this gap in carbon pricing, a second gap is that capital markets are not playing their potential role in supporting the green transition. ECB research shows that stock markets can strongly encourage investments in greener technologies. However, those markets are still relatively underdeveloped in the EU and lack of harmonization limits cross-border flows of capital. And resolving these issues and advancing a capital markets union as proposed by the European Commission, will boost the efficiency and resilience of the flow of finance in Europe. As ECB, Christine, uh, the President Christine Lagarde 
has said when speaking about the green transition, developing the capital markets union is too good an opportunity to pass up. And today I add, we must seize that opportunity. A third gap can be identified in the approach banks are taking to climate-related and environmental risks in their activities. In recent years, the ECB has conducted several benchmarking exercises among banks under our supervision to assess their practices against our supervisory expectations for a sound management of climate-related and environmental risks. These exercises showed that while almost all banks acknowledge the importance of climate-related and environmental risks, and while we are seeing progress, banks' practices to manage these risks are still underdeveloped and insufficiently applied across the board. Given these shortcomings, at present, it is difficult to see how banks can sufficiently help their customers navigate the transition and become resilient to climate change and environmental degradation in a timely manner. While most financing for green transition should come from private resources, the public sector should also have an important role to play, both directly through public investment and indirectly through co-financing, private-public partnerships, or state guarantees. Much of this will be financed at the European level through the EU member states' national recovery and resilient plans as part of Next Generation EU, a program that was set up to support the recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. How much these EU-financed expenditures will contribute to the EU's climate objectives is uncertain and depends on how successfully and quickly the individual countries implement their recovery and resilient plans. Earlier this year, the European Commission proposed a Green Deal industrial plan intended to support this effort. Analysis by ECB staff shows that from a legal and institutional perspective, public investment efforts could well be supplemented by additional EU-financed resources in the form of a European Climate and Energy Security Fund. As in the case of Next Generation EU in response to the pandemic, there are compelling arguments to suggest that the investment efforts required to support an orderly transition are exceptional, one-off and temporary. At the same time, concerns have recently emerged about member states' capacity to implement um, existing recovery and resilience plans. And these concerns can largely be traced back to administrative hurdles at the national and local level and need to be addressed before any additional resources are considered. Moreover, any additional European funds would need to be accompanied by a euro area aggregate fiscal stance that is consistent with the ECB's fight against high inflation. Besides gaps that curtail the transition, there are also gaps in the financial system that are threatening its resilience to increased climate-related and environmental damages. A recent discussion paper by the ECB and the European Insurance and Occupational Pension Authority, the IOPA, shows that only around 25% of all climate-related catastrophe losses in the European Union are currently insured. In some countries, 
including Italy, the figure is below 5%. As natural disasters become both more frequent and more severe, insurance costs are expected to rise. Some insurers may reduce risk coverage and or stop providing certain types of catastrophic insurance altogether, which would widen the insurance gap further. The lack of climate catastrophic insurance can affect the economy and financial stability. If losses are not covered by insurance, households and firms will take more time to resume their activities, slowing economic recovery. Banks' exposure to credit risk may therefore increase. And the fiscal position of governments may also be weakened if they need to provide relief to cover uninsured losses. All this confirms that when preparing for the future, we must acknowledge that the world and therefore the economy, the economy will change. And regardless of the gaps that I have described, whether they are closed or not, the economy will face profound changes and increasing shocks. And moreover, analyses consistently show that if we fail to deliver on a timely and orderly transition, the macro financial damage will be more severe than if we act in time. We are in a race against the clock and so far the clock is winning. The ECB takes the consequences of the ongoing climate and environmental crisis into account in the pursuit of its mandate. We are mindful that if we ignore these consequences, we cannot deliver on our objectives of maintaining price stability and preserving the safety and soundness of the banking system. In fact, we are committed to aligning ourselves with a pairs compatible transition path across all our tasks and responsibilities because this is a precondition for sustaining um, our tasks and responsibilities. Let me just give you two specific examples of actions that we are taking within our mandate that show our focus on some of the gaps that I've just mentioned. On the monetary policy side, in an effort to correct for the bias that exists in financial markets in favor of high emission activities, since October 2022, we have been tilting our corporate bond purchases towards those issuers with a better climate performance. Similarly, we will incorporate climate-related considerations when assessing the collateral that banks can pledge when borrowing from us as a central bank. In banking supervision, we have been persistently pushing the banks we supervise to close the gap between the practices that they have today and our expectations on the sound management of climate-related and environmental risks. Banks' practices must be fully aligned with our expectations by the end of 2024 at the latest, and we, will have, and we have set interim deadlines for banks to satisfy specific requirements even earlier than that. And if necessary, we will enforce these deadlines standing ready to use all the supervisory instruments at our disposal. Let me be clear, as a vice chair of the European Central Bank Supervisory Board, it is not for me to determine whom banks should lend to. Instead, what I and what other banking supervisors around the world have consistently been emphasizing is that a failure to adequately manage climate-related and environmental risks is no longer compatible with sound risk management. And to manage their own risks, banks need to engage with their customers to gain a deep understanding of how they are being affected by the climate and environmental crises and how they will mitigate and adapt the consequences. I come to my conclusion. Leonardo da Vinci, a resident of Florence, 
when finance first thrived back in the early days of the Renaissance, is believed to have said that nature never breaks its own laws. Indeed, nature's laws are a constraint on human activities that we cannot set aside. After all, we are an integral part of nature. We have been pushing the boundaries of this constraint far too long, and the devastating consequences are now increasingly upon us. Yet we do have the power to bend this trend, a trend that we ourselves set in motion. And this requires us to be mindful of the gaps that perpetuate the destructive trend and to work relentlessly towards closing them. Only then we can change nature's current course and ensure a Paris aligned transition path. Each and every one of us must act in our own areas of competence and responsibility, respecting nature's laws, conscious of her precariousness, preserving her preciousness. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. It was a very clear statement, and we definitely very much applaud the leadership of the European Central Bank on climate issues. But it's true that we need to have many players in it. And DGN Energy from the European Commission is definitely its center because it's one thing to make proposals, the other is really to get member states behind it. So you need to do both of it. And now, after the experience of epicenter of the crisis now coming out, what are strategic directions that you would like to continue and make strongly in the work of DG Energy, but also member states in particular push forward? Please. Thank you very much, Andres, for the question. Thank you for inviting me to, uh, to this panel in the beautiful settings. Um, I would uh, address three aspects of how we have managed the crisis, both the short term, how does it link into the structural changes that are necessary, and then the longer term of the energy union, uh, because I think essentially our crisis uh, response has been, an, has, has been so closely linked to the energy transition uh, and to the climate transition. And so the response to the climate crisis and the response to the energy crisis are aligned and have to be aligned. And that's the approach we have taken also in our short-term response. So if I start with the, with the immediate response, the emergency response, if you will, um, and the lessons learned. Uh, we have seen a weaponization of energy by Russia already prior to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. We saw reduced flows, we saw storages not being filled up, the Gazprom owned storages not being filled up. Um, and so we had to respond to that, uh, that global energy crisis that was, of course, then significantly um, reinforced by, by the invasion and by the war. Um, and I think what we have learned is that we are much better when we act together, when we are united, and that was very much the spirit in which uh, we worked with the European Parliament and the spirit in which the 27 national governments came together in, in council. So we managed to fill our storage uh, at 95%. It's a record ever high in terms of gas storage filling. Uh, we managed to reduce our gas demand significantly, close to 20% across the European Union. Um, and we managed to increase uh, investments into, uh, into renewables. Um, and we managed to stabilize prices through a number of interventions, primarily on the demand side, but also through the diversification of, uh, of supply. So I think the immediate response was both united and effective, and it gave us a lot to build on in terms of the transition and the more structural changes. So that brings me to how does this then relate to the energy transition and to the challenges of that. Um, in designing and proposing our crisis response, we established for ourselves some, some fairly basic principles. Um, and one of the key principles was whatever we do in the short term, whatever we do to address the emergency, we have to make sure that it aligns with the structural objective of climate neutrality in 2050 and the energy transition. We can't have a crisis response that pulls us in the other direction. Um, and so our crisis response, as the previous speaker mentioned, Repower EU, 
reducing our dependence on, uh, on Russian energy primarily um, was about reducing demand, energy efficiency, energy savings. It was about more renewables and faster renewables to replace fossil energy. And then, of course, it was about diversifying our supplies so we would have uh, essentially molecules from more different suppliers, but also clean molecules to the extent that's possible, uh, green hydrogen, biomethane instead of fossil gas. So, um, so an agenda that was both a, a crisis response and an immediate response, but that really has accelerated the green transition uh, and has helped increase investments. We had a record year in terms of, de uh, ex um, in terms of additional deployment of renewable uh, generation uh, across the European Union, and we expect this year to be even higher. So quite Quite some uh, important developments also in this more structural direction, um, linking into the uh, linking into the uh, green transition, including, of course, a significant increase in our ambitions. Um, so setting higher targets for renewables, higher targets for energy efficiency for 2030, which has now been agreed by the two co-legislators. So that will be our framework going forward and our very clear work program, if you will. Uh, between now and, uh, and 2030, as we look to 2040 and 2050, uh, again, in terms of addressing the climate, uh, the, the twin challenges of climate uh, um, uh, and, and energy. Um, and that brings me to the third point, which is really the more structural, uh, um, the, the longer term changes in, uh, in our economic security. I think we have seen very, very clearly over this, uh, certainly over this past year, if not before, that energy policy and energy supply is crucial both to our security, but also to our economy. Uh, we've seen a significant impact of the energy crisis, of the high energy prices on our economy, on inflation. We, have, uh, we see increase in, uh, in interest rates. And so that the economy and the security come together and we're looking at how do we strengthen our economic security and what is the role of energy policy um, in, that, uh, in that context. Part of the response has been um, uh, looking at our competitiveness and our manufacturing, the security of our supply chains. So we have made a proposal for an upgrade of the electricity market design, adapting it to the transition, adapting it to the current circumstances, but also looking ahead. How does our electricity market best support the transition and the changes that are necessary? How does our electricity market give us both secure, sustainable and affordable energy across the European Union? And then, of course, we have made proposals for the Net Zero Industrial Act, the Critical Raw Materials Act, so really linking uh, energy, the green transition, into our competitiveness, into our economy, and into our, again, economic security. So those are the three aspects that, um, that I wanted to, to set out in this context, working united immediately, making sure that our crisis response aligns with our stronger, with our longer term structural objectives, and then continuing to build the energy union, as well as our competitiveness and energy and economic security in that context. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dita. Uh, Christian is the only active politician on this stage, so uh, and there uh, we can make fantastic proposals, but we need really to get that they are accepted by our people and keep this going on. And uh, Christian, how to keep this uh, momentum, especially you are exposed in European Parliament with different political tendencies, and these political tendencies, I assume, uh, reflect what actually happens in population. How to keep the sustained support for active energy transformation? Because the biggest risk we could have if our society is split in half, or even worse, uh, don't give us support for this transition. Christian. Thank you very much. Uh, clearly, we need to find the right balance. We are working closely with the European Commission. We appreciate it very much, the proposals and also the fact that uh, the European Commission is taking into account the signals, the political signals from European Parliament, but also from the member states. And uh, in the end, our common goal is to make sure that our energy policies uh, deliver uh, well-functioning properly interconnected uh, and integrated uh, energy market that provides to our citizens and our companies uh, uh, clean, competitive and uh, decent prices uh, uh, energy in order to continue our path to the carbon neutral economy but also to uh, uh, boost even our competitiveness and preserve and increase uh, our jobs. That's why uh, in the past years and months we uh, worked together 
with the European Commission and of course we uh, uh, improved, uh, modified, uh, adopted uh, and then of course negotiated with, uh, with the Council uh, via Trilogs uh, uh, the legislation. And this legislation clearly uh, has the aim to make our energy markets uh, more competitive like uh, electricity and gas, gas directives also to increase uh, our innovation, like energy efficiency directive. Uh, and uh, uh, the other uh, ones, like renewable energy directive, to set the necessary goals in order to uh, uh, really uh, obtain our, uh, our uh, Green Deal target in 2050 with the intermediary target Fit for 55 in 2030. Also, what we legislated in the uh, past period was also uh, uh, those uh, files uh, that really is the, are the expression of solidarity and improved cohesion and security of gas supply regulation. Uh, and we worked uh, in a very quick time and we managed to have the legislation very fast and also the improvement, the revision of 10E, uh, the common interest projects, uh, as I said, uh, all of these are the expression of our solidarity and improved uh, cohesion. We live really in uh, extraordinary times. Uh, we had the pandemics, then the effects of the pandemics. Then, of course, uh, we had the inflation, the economic uh, effects. We had the uh, high prices in energy uh, at, the, at the end of uh, 2021, and this the situation was exacerbated by the aggression of Russia against Ukraine and then uh, uh, even a more difficult situation occurred. But thanks to the measures taken by European Commission, supported by European Parliament, the necessary legislation uh, and of course the actions taken by the member states, uh, the situation uh, uh, improved and now uh, the situation is more stable. Of course, it's not yet... Uh, uh, the, the danger is not yet gone. We still have this winter. We still need to find some solutions for uh, the security of gas supply. We still need uh, uh, to uh, look to the uh, legislation. But clearly, European institutions delivered. And I hope that citizens uh, and uh, national, local, regional governments uh, uh, also uh, uh, agree with this. Uh, we have also the necessary finance. Uh, we have the RRF, uh, the Repower EU, we have the cohesion funds, and of course, uh, with Net Zero Industry Act, we'll have other instruments, state aid, but not only. Uh, we have uh, the InvestEU program, the innovation program. Uh, for some of the member states, like my country, Romania, a very important tool to modernize our energy systems and to make the transition is the modernization fund. So all these instruments should be used in the most efficient, transparent, correct way in order to make this transition easier. We have even the Just Transition Fund for some regions in order to uh, make the transition from coal to clean technologies and renewable energies. Finally, if uh, uh, I would uh, deliver a main message, uh, I believe that uh, first of all we need solidarity and clearly here uh, uh, we express solidarity for the Green Deal, for the Fit for 55, a strong majority in the European Parliament and in the member states uh, is, uh, is stable. Some details, of course, are difficult, like the methane emission regulation, like the EPBD, the performance, energy performance of buildings. But the main objectives, the targets of energy efficiency, the targets for renewables, the repower EU strategy to phase out Russian imports, to invest more in renewables, in energy efficiency, the strategy for hydrogen, here a strong support is in the European Parliament. We need to continue our journey, but we need to find the right balance between the short-term measures to mitigate, to respond to the energy, high energy crisis, uh, prices crisis, uh, to long-term uh, uh, green, uh, green Deal uh, targets. And then also to balance our climate ambitions with the, the realities of our economies, because we really need to take into account the competitiveness of our industries. We need to listen their voice, we need to support our industries. That's why the 
carbon, carbon border man, uh, adjustment mechanism is extremely important for uh, uh, steel industry, for chemical industry, uh, for many other industries, and also to partner in uh, real terms with like-minded countries, with our strategic partners, like United States, Japan, South Korea, and others, in order not to be alone, but also to see our strategic goals embraced by other international players. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christian. It was really, really important what the European Parliament has delivered. It's, it's really uh, also a good trend. But now I'm coming to Marco. I understand it, Europe has delivered in solidarity. Still, we are living in times of crisis. You're the author of a book as well. You're reflecting on these issues. What is important? How to, to, to respond to it? There are tightening five fiscal rules. Some like, some didn't like. So what real economy need to be taken into account in the times of crisis? Uh, so, yes, Marco, the floor is yours. OK, thank you very much, Andri. It's now great to be here. I'm in between two jobs. So, um, so for whatever I, t I say, uh, if you find it uh, boring and uh, no part, you can attribute to, to me with the previous hat. If you hear something outrageous, then uh, 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 say that I've said it, but with a new hat. Now, um, as you said, uh, uh, Andris, I just published a, uh, published a book. The book is in Italian, so it is uh, for only part of the audience. Um, and what, uh, so the title is uh, Was Jean Monnet right? Uh, question mark. And actually, the subtitle is almost the same as uh, this one here, because it's building Europe in, time, uh, in times of crisis uh, and uh, in times of uncertainty. So that's where we are. I mean, the, what I say in the, uh, in the book, I, I take as, an, as, an in, uh, let's say, as a conceptual framework what I call uh, the Monet compatibility test. And I will try to apply the Monet compatibility test to what we are doing in terms of uh, the climate transition. And the Monet compatibility test is basically made of three aspects. The first one is economic compatibility, second is the institutional compatibility, and the third one is political compatibility. So if you are compatible under these three different uh, channels, then you pass the Monet compatibility test. Now, how do you apply this to the present, uh, uh, um, to, the, to the climate transition? I think in terms of the economic compatibility, I think it is fair to, um, in order to be credible, to acknowledge that we are facing a number of trade-offs. Very important, trade-offs, yes, but there are more trade-offs in the short term rather than in the longer term. So the trade-off take sustainability. You have sustainability from the you know, climate viewpoint, from the point of view of um, fiscal, from the point of view of social. Um, so I think you have to square the circle uh, there. What the experience that we have, I think, in the past year, I think Dieter was uh, there, he has uh, witnessed and pushed for, uh, for that, the European Parliament as well, is that it can be done. Mm -hmm. I think mean, maybe not many have noticed, uh, um, but for the first time last year, we had the climate, uh, uh, we had the ele electricity production from renewable, which actually higher for the first time ever higher than uh, uh, electricity produced from f fossil fuels. There, is, there are uh, estimates of uh, investment needs. I think the um, uh, estimates are different, but by and large between 2.5% two, two um, percent of GDP um, from here till uh, 2030. Again, it's a, it's a large number, but it is feasible, but it requires clearly a reallocation of uh, resources in an important uh, manner. So from the economic viewpoint, I think acknowledge that you have uh, a positive demand effect, more investment. You have an, a negative uh, supply effect in the short term because uh, some, number, you know, some capital becomes uh, uh, outdated, has to be replaced. 
So, and here, uh, looking at Frank, I mean, you have also the issue of greenflation, uh, which may uh, somehow complicate our, our task. Now, from the institutional uh, viewpoint, I think here um, we have to provide uh, the policy response uh, which favors, which provides incentives to do the right thing. Uh, we have just proposed the um, uh, legislative, legislative uh, framework uh, for uh, uh, reviewing the fiscal rules and stability and growth pact. So we, what we are doing there, we provide incentives by slowing down the, um, the path of, uh, uh, of, debt, uh, of debt reduction under certain conditions. And some of those conditions is that if you allocate the resources to EU priorities, including first and foremost the green uh, transition, then you gain some more time. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important institutionally we complete other open chantier. Capital market union is, uh, is key for this. Um, I mean, many of these proposals uh, and these investments are, let me, put it, let me put it like that in a crude way, um, they are long in ideas and short in collateral. So you need capital markets union, you cannot expect b normal banks to finance most of, the, most of this. So I think this is uh, it's really very, uh, very important. And we need to have uh, vertical coordination between the EU budget and what we do at the national level. And I think here the new frontier in this, um, uh, in this area is European public goods, really transnational goods, transnational investments uh, we, where um, we put more resources. Finally, is the political transition. It was said before, I think I fully agree, we are not going to be able to succeed uh, if we do it against people, against business, against enterprises. We are not going to succeed on that. So I think we have to bring them with us and you know, provide the um, the right policies in order to accompany the transition. I think here we have a bit of a tension between credibility, which implies short-term targets, and gradualism, which would make it feasible. So I think we have to square here the, um, the circle on that. But it is very, very important that uh, uh, we bring enterprises together and we bring people together, so the issue of just transition is absolutely key to respect the political uh, compatibility. So you do this and you pass the Monet compatibility test. Now we will try to, thank you, Marco. We will now try to pass compatibility test with the audience. Marcia. Thank you, so thank you for uh, such a comprehensive overview of, um, to the speakers for the future direction of uh, the energy transition, people, society. We touched upon um, the financial sectors uh, and fiscal rules. So now we are going to open up the floor for um, questions uh, to the audience. So if you would like to ask a question, please um, raise your hand. Um, and the mic will get to you. Uh, the re there are a couple of questions. Uh, so please um, introduce yourself and if you can be as brief and as to the point as possible so we can you know, have uh, as many questions um, uh, asked as possible and also if you can tell us who would you like to pose your question to, that would be great. If you allow me, I will place two questions. Okay. I'm uh, Alberto Mazzolan, Director of the European Railway Association. Let's say we are facing the crisis and we see that the electricity prices, even at the end of the year, is higher than the price of fossil fuels before. So we are going still in the opposite direction. It seems that demand is growing much higher in electricity than supply. When are we going to match it? Otherwise, I think the transition will be not uh, in the right way. The second question is about the capital markets. We are not witnessing capitals going green as much as it is expected as announced. Let's say as railways, we don't see capitals coming, private capitals, and I think in pension funds and uh, <clears throat> investment funds going long term in these things. So when can we expect to get a result uh, in these terms? 
Thank you. So maybe the second question, if uh, Mr. Anderson would like to take the second one. Well, what, what I would like to say on Capital Markets Union, um, I could not agree more. So the sooner the better. Uh, we need uh, um, progress there. Uh, it, the, the, it's not within the mandate of the, of the European Central Bank to, to bring that about. So I think it is maybe better to look a little bit to my left uh, to some of the other speakers. Uh, but, but the urgency and the need of Capital Markets Union, um, I could not agree more. I think it is a key question. So, uh, Mrs. Jorgensen, if you would like to say a word. Yes, thank you to your, your first question on electricity prices and electricity costs and how they have reacted and beset by the very high fossil prices. So um, essentially, our first of all, on electricity, we don't have a supply demand gap. We have been through a crisis. We haven't faced any blackout. So our, our market and our system has delivered security of supply. And it has delivered significant investments and cost reductions over the past decade. Um, what we have is a market that incentivizes investments into renewables and therefore helps the transition. But we also have an electricity system across the European Union where fossil is still an important factor. You mentioned that we now generate more electricity from renewables than we did from natural gas for the first time. But we still have natural gas and coal as part of our electricity system. Um, and because we operate as a market, we operate as a market in order to make sure that, that, that we have security of supply, that we have the electricity we need, and that that electricity can flow across borders in an internal energy market, because that's the only way to stay secure. Then prices will, at times, be set by the highest cost. And with a very high increase in gas prices over the last year, then gas often became the price setter. And that brought high electricity prices, unacceptably high electricity prices, over the last year. So what we need to do is to try to make sure that the bill that uh, households and businesses pay is not linked to this short-term price volatility of fossil prices, but rather linked more closely into the very low costs of renewables. Renewables, in particular photovoltaic and wind, are by far the lowest cost electricity we can give ourselves. And so what we are doing in our proposal for a changed electricity market design is to try to, um, to cut that link between the bills and the, and the short-term volatility, make, make a stronger room, make more room for longer-term market arrangements, power purchasing agreements, contracts for difference, that, makes, that helps make uh, the bills lower because they will be more closely linked to the lower cost of renewables. And at the same time, we incentivize and facilitate further investments into renewables, again, because it is the lowest cost electricity we can give ourselves. And it is the more secure form of electricity because we do not depend on foreign suppliers. So the transition will help lower costs and lower prices over time. But managing the transition is the challenge. And that's where the renewed electricity market design will help reduce the dependence on the high fossil prices, it will empower consumers so they can make a choice and they can share energy, uh, and it will incentivize investments into renewables for a larger low-cost share in the overall electricity generation, as we started to see last year, uh, but of course it's a transition. Yeah, thank you. Very clear and sensible. Plan. Yes, sure. Oh, just, very, just very shortly, in, uh, in addition to uh, what one uh, what on what uh, Director General Jorgensen, what did I said, because I agree with the anal analysis and uh, clearly we need to uh, look into the future uh, to really give the necessary support to the renewables in order to have more stable and more decent prices for our industries and consumers. But uh, we need also to diversify because the main problem was that we were highly dependent on Russian gas. Is not necessary uh, the gas itself, even that, uh, of course, uh, this kind of commodities could uh, uh, open a different crisis in the future also. But uh, it was also because we are very dependent on Russian gas. That's why diversifying the gas supply is extremely important for the transition period. Then, of course, renewables are the key answer, uh, combined with storage, because uh, clearly we part of the situation before the uh, war in Ukraine was also uh, the uh, low production of electricity from uh, hydro and from uh, wind. 
we had some issues with the wind in the north uh, of Europe. That's why we need storage and we need also solutions to balance the system. For those countries like my country and many others, of course, nuclear energy is a solution. For others, they could, could find another solution. But when we are not over-dependent on one source, on one supplier, then this kind of crisis could be avoided in the future. And what the European Commission proposed in the uh, electricity market design revision to look more to the long-term agreements, to the long-term contracts, this also will help to stabilize and balance the system. Thank you, Mr. Buzoi. So we heard um, diversification as a short-term, long-term renewable, um, and then we heard um, solution to balance uh, the system in the long run. Um, thank you. Uh, any other question? Yes, please, here. Can we give a microphone to the gentleman? All right. Thank you very much. Arthur Unger Metzger, uh, former commission official, now with very different hats on. Um, and it goes exactly into the same direction. Because, to be honest, I'm not worried about electricity. The EU has made the decision that we will defossilize the electricity sector before the year 2035. Uh, and I'm more worried about kind of where we use fossil fuels outside the electricity sector. So that's for heating, that's for transport, and that's in industry. And I agree very much with um, Member of Parliament Boussoy that we need to look at the reality of our economy. And the reality of our economy is that we are vulnerable in those prospects and that we need to be really become energy secure. So when is the Commission going to define energy security for those sectors, meaning when are we going to get out of fossil fuels, uh, also in those sectors? And I want to point to a study that came out yesterday, which said this could be done by the year 2040 um, in all those sectors where we still rely heavily on fossil fuels. So when is the Commission going to come out? And is 2040 not a good year for that? Thank you. Yes, please. <coughs> uh, yep. I'm not sure. Yes. yes. Thank you very much for the good questions. Um, so um, the, f the way out of fossil starts with energy efficiency. If we do not become more efficient in the way we use the energy we have, it will not be possible. So the first answer is energy efficiency, both in terms of stepping up our ambitions, but also stepping up our regulatory frameworks and the investments, the financing necessary to make energy efficiency happen faster than what it does now. The second answer to the phasing out of fossil is renewable energy, accelerating the deployment of renewable energy. We had last year a significant increase. We expect more this year, and we need to continue that trend. We need to make sure that we have the right frameworks for that acceleration, and that we have all the various pieces that we need together, our supply chains, our skills, um, uh, our investment framework, our financial framework, uh, and our own uh, competitiveness and manufacturing capacity in the European Union, as set out under the Net Zero Industrial Act. And then the third aspect of phasing out fossil is that of what are the alternatives where molecules are needed? What are the alternatives where we have so far relied on, um, on, uh, on fossil molecules, on gas in particular, and you're pointing rightly to transport and industry and heating as the main sectors. That is where the fossil molecules essentially go. Some of those uses can be replaced by electricity. So the electrification of our economy, the electrification of our heating system, the electrification of our transport system is the most energy efficient way to do that and to phase out, uh, reduce the use of fossil in those sectors. And essentially that means heat pumps in houses. And we saw last year the biggest ever rollout of heat pumps across the European Union. In Poland alone, there was a growth of 120% in the demand and installation of heat pumps. So quite a significant uh, development. And the electrified heating is so much more energy efficient. So it's not because it's electricity that it's better. It is because it is a lot more energy efficient. Similarly, we need to shift the transport system and electrify the transport system. An electric car is three times more energy efficient than a combustion engine car. And so again, it's not because it's electricity per se, it is the energy efficiency. 
And then we have some industrial sectors where that transformation is more challenging and where you cannot uh, electrify easily or at a, at a sensible cost, so the hard to abate sectors. And here we've got a number of strategic elements that will help us accelerate and push the phase out of, of fossil, most notably our hydrogen strategy, the recently proposed hydrogen bank that will help um, the hydrogen market, the supply demand meet and take off so that we can develop that uh, energy carrier, that energy vector also for our industrial sectors and for heavy duty transport where again electrification is challenging. So I think we have the components of a strategy that will uh, help uh, uh, accelerate the phase out of fossil fuels but we need to um, deploy all of those different aspects, energy efficiency, renewables, diversification, as, as Mr. Bouchard has also said, but also the new technologies that will help make that happen, including electrification. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I think, sorry, Anders, I think Mr. Uh, Bouti would like to say yeah. something to yes, complement. No, um, no, just, com just to complement, I mean, Dita is absolutely uh, right. Uh, and when I said in my first intervention that uh, it can be done, I think also in this uh, uh, area here, um, I mean, the conclusion, that conclusion remains. I mean, if you look at the demand of, uh, you know, gas demand over the last year, I mean, it has fallen by, you know, 15%. Uh, so that is, uh, I think it's a, it's an imp a very important signal. Um, gas, total gas imports, actually from the, to the European Union, uh, fell by uh, about uh, 23% uh, uh, overall. So, um, and what we have done, I mean, we have been able, and here political will actually shows that uh, um, a, uh, progress can be done also in the short term. I mean, we have, uh, we have done a, a little miracle, as, uh, as the uh, President Bardet Lyon says, in reducing uh, gas imports to a, f to a fraction, basically from, um, from Russia. And, uh, uh, Dita mentioned it, you know, heat pumps uh, um, plus 38% uh, in overall in the EU la, uh, uh, last year. So I think this is, um, is something that uh, uh, I think is important and uh, showing that, you know, put the right resources uh, and the right political will can allow to, to succeed. Thank, Thank you. you. In the panel, times always pass too quickly. So I just uh, could thank uh, Frank Elderson, uh, Christian Silvio Busoi, uh, Marco Buti, and Diti Yul Jorgensen for excellent presentation. There are many questions that need to be answered, but you can be assured that on climate and energy issues, I believe Europe is on good track. And for me, it is important that all institutions are really putting real ambition into this. It's not just scratching the surface, going into depth. So thank you very much, uh, the speakers, and thank you, audience, and thank you for the questions that have been asked, and also for questions that have been prepared and have not been time timely delivered. So thank you very much. retire soon, no? Did I see that on Twitter? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, do not go anywhere. There will be no break, but there will be a break in an hour. So stay seated because we still have two or three super interesting sessions before we break for lunch. So don't go anywhere. Um, because we heard this morning already Central Europe be mentioned a lot and the impact, of course, that the war in Ukraine is having on those countries. It's a domestic, major domestic story for them every single day as opposed to in other member states. So this session will focus on what's at stake for them. It's entitled Love Thy Neighbour, Central European Politics and the War in Ukraine. 
This session, ladies and gentlemen, will be moderated by Peggy Hollinger. She is the international business, business editor with the Financial Times, uh, one of the media partners, along with Euronews and ANSA and Politico, that are supporting this event today, the State of the Union. And she'll be sitting down on stage right here with um, the Minister of Foreign Affairs from Slovakia, that's Radislav Kacher, and also the Minister for International and European Affairs from Austria, that's of course Alexander Schallenberg. So enjoy the discussion. Over to you, Peggy. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone for being here, and especially my colleagues here on the panel. We're very lucky to have them, and it's certainly a very big pleasure for me to be here. Um, I feel like I have the most interesting session of the entire summit because this is the region that really truly is at the front line of a lot of what's happening today. Um, so I think I'd like to uh, just very quickly uh, ask the first question. I mean, Central Europe has shown remarkable unity in the face of the conflict, the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine. But equally, this particular situation has highlighted a lot of the divisions in the region. So my first question is, do you really love your neighbor, as the title suggests? And I'd like to ask Minister Schallenberg first. My short answer would be yes, we do. Um, we share a lot. We have a, a same you know, foundation of values. We, have, we do have different uh, history in Central Europe. Um, there was a history of the last seven, uh, in the 20th century. There were those countries were uh, suffering under the Soviet rule, which were behind the Iron Curtain. Austria luckily had a different history. But we are very much united in the com current struggle, you might say, and, and uh, challenge we are facing. And as we discussed just beforehand, I might say, before coming on stage, we have many, many formats where we meet again and again, and it is, it is necessary. It is a region which is a cultural unit. It's a region which has a common history for thousands of years, and um, which is, whether they, we want it or not, always affected by any crisis going on in Europe. Whether it's southern, you know, the Balkans, whether it's southern Europe, eastern Europe, we are at the crossroads. And whether we like it or not, we are always affected by all this crisis. And this is something that brings us together, actually. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Minister Kescher. Well, this is an easy thing because our closest neighbor, the suburbs of Bratislava in Vienna, and uh, um, the closest neighbor I love absolutely. There is no other minister among uh, our EU 27 whom I would love more than Alexander. And I'm, I, as I say, as a public statement, uh, and I'm not going to recall it any time. They've been uh, doing that back behind the scenes as well, so it's <laughs> not a lie. Go yeah, on. it's not a lie. Um, we got the witness. On a longer answer, um, in Slovakia, there is a habit of countrymen, and I got country house, and you got one neighbor from the other side, and the other neighbor on, on the other side. Usually, usually, uh, you hate one neighbor, and the other neighbor is your ally. And this sometimes translates uh, into a more complicated relationship, but to me, the homey feeling where I feel at home, I mean intellectually and by the way of life, it comes to this middle Europa concept because this was created by over the centuries. And when I come, it starts to me in Alsace. Probably it covers roughly this Habsburg world. It starts with Alsace. You got Eau de Vie, we call it Palenka. And you continue through Switzerland, Bavaria, Austria, uh, Czech Republic, particularly Moravia, Slovakia, Hungary, and probably north of Balkans. That's very homey feeling. And I love that. I love that feeling. But it's a long relationship. As we were uh, talking in the room, long relationships bring a lot of in common, but they create other, also a lot of problems. What is an important thing to love thy neighbor? It's to build on what we have in common and then take something what we might have in a difference. I think that's particularly important. Thank you very much. So building on what you have in common, hugely Im important. But you know, recently we've had a number of unilateral actions, you know, bans on grain imports from Ukraine, migration, bans on migration, border closures. What are the limits to this collaboration and solidarity when you look at this region in the face of uh, the, the, the war with Russia? Minister Kacher. Um, well, grain on, on Ukraine, I was asked by, by journalists. This is what we learned in the EU. 
This is what we learned in common agricultural policy. When we were joining EU, we didn't understand what are the protective measures of the French farmer, his code name of a French farmer. So protecting the way of life and protecting the production uh, against tough competition from the other world, this is what we, were, what, what we got uh, from the EU. Now we apply the same thing because Poland uh, cut the, the imports because of protection uh, of the production, because what was supposed to be a free corridor of transport because of uh, the uh, impossible, uh, because route being cut through the sea. So this was a corridor of the, of the crops uh, uh, more to the other world. It stayed for very, very, very competitive price and uh, probably uh, the agricultural lobby went over the roof. Luckily, this was only a short episode and commission took over, as it should rightfully so, because this is, this is the thing. But um, when it comes on policies on Ukraine, to us, and I think to all of us, uh, and this is not only a neighborhood issue, this is issue of principles within the all EU communities, that we cannot accept this post-imperialistic behavior that your neighbor will come and we say, I love your neighbor. Russia is not behaving in this way. They say, no, this is not a neighbor. This is my historical territory. We will take you over and you got no right to exist. And I think this is the issue which cannot be acceptable to nobody, not only in the countries, for the countries in, on the front line. Thank you. Uh, Minister Schallenberg, do you, do you see the limits to solidarity in the same way or differently? Well, it depends on the matter at stake. Um, I fully agree with Rastislav when you say, when we look at Ukraine, and you could say Austria is, for instance, a neutral country, you are a member of NATO, we are in full solidarity on this issue. Why? Because we share one thing, and this is the same set of values. We are smaller countries. We depend on an international system which is a rules-based system. We don't want the law of the jungle, we want the rule of law. And that's why we are so strongly united on this issue. There are other issues, and you have pointed to agricultural policy in the past, and even in the present to a certain degree, but you said, you mentioned migration, for instance. There's an issue where, you know, you have the problem that it is a, a policy defined by bystanders. Because it's always only one or two or three countries being affected. If suddenly you have a crisis, and now you have a situation in Italy, um, uh, most other European countries are watching. Passive, passively. And last year it was us. We had per capita the highest number of asylum seekers in continental Europe. Although we are surrounded by EU member states, although we are surrounded by Schengen member states, well, Switzerland, Liechtenstein are associated Schengen states and, and uh, are not EU as such, um, but still try to make it understand an Austrian citizen how come we have a higher number of asylum seekers than anybody else on continental Europe. And now other countries are affected. The next time it might be Slovakia, the next time it might be Spain again. And the problem is here, what we sometimes underestimate in Europe, we take each other for granted. We believe that we know everything of each other because we meet once a month the foreign ministers. And what we sometimes don't do enough is actually really listen to each other, to make an outreach, to talk. And it is still within the European family, we still have to do that, even in our neighborhood. And that's why these formats we're having, Slavkov 3, Central 5, the trilateral with Slovenia and, and Croatia from Austria, it's so important for me because I need to talk to my neighbors to understand their issues. And sometimes we don't do that enough to a certain degree. And we have on migration, we have this policy with, I'm very happy, the Austrian Chancellor was just in Rome and we decided that we are really want to work in common with our Italian friends. We have a common objective, we want a common asylum and migration policy, which actually works, and where we don't have the feeling that every second or third year we have a migration crisis and the rest of Europe is watching on. So it's, it's quite interesting that if you think there's been a lot of speculation, not speculation, a lot of um, thinking about the role of Central Europe within, in light of the Ukraine situation, that Central Europe has sort of moved front of, front of house, if you like, in terms of influence, that maybe influence is shifting from west towards east because you are very much on the front line. And you're talking about migration policy and Europe's not listening. Do you, do you think that that speculation about the, sort of the rise of Central Europe move, getting more and more influence, do you think that's just um, not true? Do you think that's just a, a myth? Um, or do you think there really is a case for Central Europe actually having greater influence 
in the EU despite the issues on migration? What do you well, think? I mean, there's the talk that the center of gravity in the European Union is moving towards the east. Um, I would say it's moving towards the center because we are finally getting to become a union of 27 states. It took us some time to really intellectually, maybe we still have a way to go. We still have the way to go in the countries which joined in 2004, 7, and later on, and on the other side of, of the aisle, so to say. Um, and, but uh, I wouldn't exaggerate uh, the center of gravity talk. This is something think tanks like. You talk, it depends on the issue at stake. You might have other issues where suddenly, you know, partners like France or Spain have the most dominant voice because they have the know-how, they have the knowledge. Other issues like, you know, we are front states. Ukraine is 500 kilometers away uh, from Vienna. It's closer to Vienna than the westernmost part of Austria. And Austria is not a big country. And it's, Ukraine is a neighboring state of Slovakia. And I will never forget a sentence said by the Prime Minister, Edward Heger, who I appreciate a lot. Last year, in early summer, we discussed about sanctions. And then he said something, Alexander, you have to know, I don't want Russia as a neighbor. And that is something which I kept in mind because it changes the whole ball game. Whether you are a country which actually is neighboring the battlefield and where if everything goes wrong and we didn't support Ukraine, you might end up having Russia as your neighbor. So there, in this sense, it's very important that these countries are listened to, that they have a strong voice. But we have to be 27 at the end of the day. And there are other issues at stake if we talk about the outreach, the global south, where the center of gravity might be, or the center of knowledge or know-how might be a little bit elsewhere. Um, so I think I've been around in European policies for 20 years, and I remember during the Euro crisis, everybody said, well, now is the age of domination by Germany. I said, yes, because we're talking about the Euro financial issues. On other issues, other partners are more important or are equally important. So I wouldn't overestimate the center of gravity talk. So ultimately, uh, Mr. Kutcher, you think uh, that, do you think that there, we are really moving towards a union of 27 equal member states? And, and that as uh, Minister Schallenberg is saying, it depends on the subject. Do you feel that the core of the European Union is taking Central Europe more seriously than it did in the past? Is it only temporary? You know, these kind of questions on uh, where the center of gravity or decision-making power moves. I, I, in principle, I hate that question. It reminds me when I was a little boy and I was visiting most my, my grandparents in the countryside and uh, my grandma came to me and said, you know, who you love more, your grandpa or me? And, uh, and then uh, if I said, I love you more, uh, she would immediately come to him and she said, well, he loves me more than you. And since the time, I hate that question because I, like, I love the concept of family unity and equal distribution of love. And this I would love to see applied within the European Union because I think it's of particular importance that all of us feel an equal share of love in decision making. And this is the charm as we sit in the room um, in the FAC Council and other council meetings, that's a large uh, elliptical, you know, no uh, table. Nobody sits in the corner. All of us had, has got a voice. And I just hate these kind of measurings. Uh, well, I would say uh, bad things uh, saying about measuring. I shouldn't be that going there. But uh, uh, let me say, um, I love the stage where we are, because this was not long ago. It's not that many years ago when, at the time, French president said in similar occasion that these Central European states missed the opportunity to shut up. We don't hear this anymore. So I think we are moving in the right direction. If Alexander was saying we, the, 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 it moves, the gravity moves towards the center, I think it's a good notion in general. I think we see more equal distribution of, of value and, 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 and the power. Thank you for that. But there is, there is a rogue element here. I mean, let's, let's look at Hungary in terms of regional cooperation. I mean, how disloyal can you be and still be part of the club? How disloyal can you be and still be part of the club? Well, let me tell you one thing. Um, when you go to uh, f uh, the meetings of the EU foreign ministers and we discuss sanctions, for instance, on Ukraine, there's no veto, there, there's no harsh language. 
So you have to make a difference what is for the gallery, what is national talk at home, and what is actually happening on the ground. We have decided on 10 sanctions packages. We have been prolonging the sanctions since 2014 on the Crimea. And we had again and again talks. I remember in 2018 when we were presiding the European Union, we had the presidency, we were afraid that there might be a coalition forming between some parts of government here in, in, in Italy and the Hungarians and others concerning the possibility of blocking the prolongation of sanctions on Crimea. It didn't happen. So there's, there's one thing which is, happen, which is happening in, in, in the public, and other things are happening actually when you talk on, on, on the basis in the room. So this is as far as Ukraine is, is concerned. And that my feeling is, and I have to say, and I'm saying it again and again, um, I have been several years um, in council meetings, as a minister and in other functions. I've never seen this sense of unity, of cohesion, which we experience after February. Will it be there forever? Probably not. Is it a struggle to get there? Absolutely. But we do have this unity, and it's our biggest asset. And I believe everybody in Europe understands our unity is our biggest asset. In the moment we're disunited, we have lost, and everybody would have lost, Hungary included. I totally agree, but there, there, there are potential threats to some of that unity. You're about to go into an election in September. What happens if uh, Robert Fico comes back? Do you, what do you think the implications of that would be? And what are the chances? Well, I don't know, you know. Um... It's a long question, and, and I combine it, these together. I'm, I'm thinking carefully what to say, because then I'm usually immediately labeled uh, um, whatever, you know. It'll take me a couple of seconds to, to reflect and quickly uh, what to say. First, there is a risk that uh, uh, ex-Prime Minister Fitzo may take over. He's now uh, rated at the top of the preferences, and he's openly coming with pre-election rhetoric which is saying, I want to do it as Viktor Orban. It's the first thing. And I mean, he's, this is not only related to policy on Russia. I think he wants to get a lot of inspiration how to grab the power and how to use the instrument uh, to hold the power. Uh, and I think this is also the problem uh, for us collectively and for commission uh, judging on the rule of law of principles. So if he's saying that I want to do it as Viktor Orban, to me, that is a problem as, as to the citizen, not only as to the foreign minister. And he comes also uh, on the top of that saying, we will immediately stop supporting Ukraine. And the rhetoric which he's using, it comes out of the uh, propaganda uh, book of uh, Kremlin. And that disturbs me a lot, uh, not only, again, as a foreign minister, but also as an active citizen of Slovakia who spent 30 years of um, making Slovakia an equal part of decision-making uh, within NATO and EU. If you want my prediction how this is going to end at the end of September, and, um, and I try to be as unbiased as I can, I'm not going to run in in, the, in, in politics, in party politics, so I'm, I can be impartial on that. My guess is that Mr. Fizzo may have success in the election, but might have a huge problems to pull the government together. And I wish uh, he would be the strongest party in next uh, Slovak parliament in the opposition. I wish him his, the success very much. Thank you for that. Now, as I've asked you the tough question, I'm going to ask you, Mr. Schallenberg, a tough question. Austria's ongoing trade with Russia, when is that going to stop? Um, well, actually, we are, and yes, you're completely right, among those countries, together with Germany, I would say, economically most affected. Um, Austrian companies have been highly successful in the last 30 years, you know, to be investing in Belarus, in Ukraine, and in Russia. And there's, I have to write off hundreds of millions of euros. Um, and they're doing so. And there's a kind of, and many of them are pulling back. And, uh, but I'm not a friend of decoupling. Um, neither with China, it's a de-risking, de but decoupling I'm not a friend of. Um, for me, the important thing is, I'm probably referring to the gas issue. Yes, we made mistakes to a certain degree. Um, spilled milk, you could say, that we have been, become too dependent on one deliverer on the gas issue, and that was Russia. You, although you have to say we need gas, only 80% of energy production in Austria is based on gas. And there again, we get only a share from Russia. We have managed something I wouldn't have thought possible. 
In February, when the war started, Austria had an 80% dependency of deliveries of gas from Russia. Over the last 12 months, we have lowered it by 50%. Now we are again back to 70, 80%, but that depends also on what comes from Norway and other deliverers. Our aim is very clear. We again had a government meeting on that two days ago in, in Vienna, that we will continue this, this separation from Russia. So there, yes, there is a certain decoupling. We have to diversify. That is something we already said in 2006. I remember when we had the first time, first day of the presidency in 2006, first of January, and there was no gas coming through the pipelines in Ukraine. Um, and at the time, we had this common conclusions in Europe saying diversification. But nothing happened, because in the moment the gas was flowing again, the pain was gone. And we continued because it was cheap, it was reliable. And to say one thing, and that is the, the shock to a certain degree, Austria was the first country, Western country, to enter agreements at the time of the OMV with Gazprom on gas deliveries in 1968. Soviet Union was dismantled. Iron Curtain fell. Gas was always delivered, and we paid. The first guy changing that and making a weapon out of it was Vladimir Putin. So he did, he did something that not even Brezhnev or Chernenko in Soviet times dared do, to put on stake actually the, the credibility of Russia of being a partner ever again in commercial terms. And that is something that is even observed in New Delhi and in other, in other countries. So yes, the decoupling will continue. It's, it's an effort. Um, but we are actually on a good track. But we are landlocked. We cannot buy, we cannot build LNG terminals. We are dependent on what other countries are doing in this regard. Okay, thank you very much. And I think the, the, the big question that remains with just a, a couple of minutes left is obviously enlargement. The EU has committed to Ukraine's membership to Moldova and Georgia as well. What about the Western Balkans? You know, what should be the sequence of the accession of the Western Balkans? How do you see that playing out? Um, very briefly, um, I believe this is the litmus test for the European Union, geostrategically speaking. Um, this is not the backyard, it's a patio, the Western Balkans. It's surrounded by EU member states. It's the center court of Europe. Whatever happens there has a direct effect in Bratislava, in Vienna, in Berlin, and other places. So we, yes, it's right to have a focus on Ukraine and to, to bring them on with Moldova together. But please, not, let's not create an animal farm kind of system. Everybody is equal as a Canada country, but some are more equal than others. I don't want animal farm as far as enlargement is concerned. If, if we do something on Ukraine, we should do the same, same thing on, on, on the Western so Balkans. So in tandem? Sorry? In tandem, in parallel? Well, we are risking of losing this region. And in politics, there's no vacuum. If, it, if it's not the European Union, our model of life, then we will suddenly face there with other models coming from China, Turkey, Russia, wherever it might be. And yes, Russia still has a spoiling capacity in the region. It is a volatile region. And I believe we, we have ne been neglecting it. And I can cite one prime minister, one Western Balkan country who said, um, ironically, do we have to start a war in the Western Balkans so that you start looking at us? That's well, pretty dramatic. We have less than a minute left. You're fine with the answer. You agree with everything. No, you know, I, I still, I'm still happy that EU is sexy enough that somebody is interested in joining. That is a good news. Uh, we were talking of soft power of EU, and this is the soft power of EU what we need. And now we need to work double trucks to keep precisely what Alexander was saying, being attractive model and serve as an inspiration and have a gravity which will pull countries towards us. But second challenge for us, it's need to work on hard power of Europe, and we've been doing so in the last year. So making Europe more consistent, more coherent, and stronger together, also in security and defense, in strategic outlook, uh, and also being a power on its own in the world. And these two things combined, that is a challenge, but I absolutely agree. This was only on the top of that cake, what Alexander was mentioning. We literally have enough. Is it very quick, like two seconds? Maybe two seconds. I just wanted to say, to a certain degree, we have to be thankful to Vladimir Putin in an ironical sense because he has invigorated us again. He has united us again, mm -hmm. and he has made people understand that the biggest, most uh, important instrument we have to transform our surroundings is enlargement. 
It has been done in Greece in 81, Spain, Portugal 86, and we have lost this knowledge to a certain degree, and now we are regaining it, and understanding enlargement is our most important geopolitical tool. Thank you very much. That's unity and adversity, but it's been a fascinating panel. I'd like to thank you both um, for everything, for all your contributions, and thank you to the audience for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you so much to the gentleman there and, of course, to Peggy for that moderation. Just like last year, it was another fascinating discussion. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for the State of the Union lecture. This year's lecture will be given by Anton Hermerich. He's the professor here at the European University Institute of Politics and Sociology, and he's also a former advisor to the European Commission on Social Policy and Welfare State. So put your hands together, please, now for Anton Hermerich. Very interesting discussion. Is it working? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a real honor for me to speak at the 2023 edition of the EOI State of the Union. Grazie per l'invito. Over the next 25 minutes, at the risk of being accused by my colleagues of engaging in a weak history of our polycrisis epoch, I will argue that in the medium and longer term, the alleged big trade-off between equity and efficiency and the equally popular trilemma between employment redistribution and fiscal balance no longer apply. It's time for us to recognize that far from crowding out scarce resources, well-funded and active welfare states are a sine qua non to the resilience of liberal democracies, knowledge economies, and aging societies. I will draw on four temporally ordered lessons, bringing out two supportive cheers for the welfare state, followed by praise for the European Central Bank, and then, last but not least, a compliment for the European polity at large, and I conclude by making a modest proposal. On to lesson one. In times of turbulence and transformation, policymakers and academics are often confronted with the uncomfortable truth that past theories no longer pertain. This is not to be taken lightly, because the hardest part of any learning process is the unlearning of old beliefs. In her address to the World Economic Forum in Davos on the 24th of January 2013, the then German Chancellor, Angela Merkel, dramatized the European Great Recession predicament by underscoring that the continent represents 7% of the world's population, 25% of the world's GDP, and 50% of the world's social spending, implying that such ratios were unsustainable in an era of intensified global competition. As costly bank bailouts drained the public purse, she inferred that fiscal consolidation had to gain primacy in tackling the aftershocks of the global financial crisis, requiring across-the-board cuts in welfare benefits and social services. It is important to acknowledge that Merkel's critique was nothing new. The economic and monetary union fiscal threat threshold values of 3% on public deficits and 60% on debt relative to GDP were enshrined in the Stability and Growth Pact and underwritten by the No Bill Out Clause in the Maastricht Treaty. The thinking behind these rules was premised on the idea that fiscal limits on public spending were key to keep wasteful welfare states in check. Since the stagflation crisis of the 1970s and 1980s, 
generous welfare provision was believed to crowd out private initiative and to set the scene for stagnant growth, high levels of unemployment, and permanent wage inflation. Looking back on the long decade of the Great Recession, it's undeniable that many of Europe's most generous and inclusive welfare states are also among the most competitive economies in the world, including Germany, which, under Merkel, preserved social spending and ratcheted up social services for working families with children. What made the Great Recession a recession and not a depression, as in the 1930s, was that it was not allowed to persist. Policymakers swiftly launched counter-cyclical monetary and fiscal policies. Compared to the United States, the European policymakers were kind of slow to recognize the severity of the credit crunch. On the other hand, many EU member states presided over far more generous automatic stabilizers in the form of unemployment insurance and minimum income protection, absorb absorbing close to 50% of, of the impending uh, unemployment shock, compared to the US figure of just over 30%. In hindsight, Europe's more comprehensive and expensive welfare state buffered the crisis and the, buffered the Great Recession and the Euro crisis well. This included France, the Netherlands, Finland, Sweden, most of the countries of Northwestern and continental Europe. For these countries, income support mechanisms created for demand-efficient recessions with high unemployment really did kick in. As earnings fell, social benefits were there to mitigate poverty and cushion the macroeconomy. On the other hand, Greece, Ireland, Italy, Portugal, and Spain retrenched social spending pro-cyclically, and more on health and education than on pensions, as the economy contracted and unemployment grew. These countries were also more constrained by the fiscal rule book of the incomplete Economic and Monetary Union, the EMU, to which I will return later. Overall, my lesson is that comprehensive and inclusive safety nets proved their worth, precisely as Keynes and Beveridge had anticipated in the 1930s and 1940s. This commonsensical hindsight, however, begs the question why Merkel, and no less important, the original architects of the EMU, seemingly discounted the relevance of social protection income buffers. My hunch is that since the 1980s, policymakers, and again also many academics, had bought into the promises of economic liberalization and market making European integration at the, at the expense of seriously probing the policy vulnerabilities and the governance weaknesses. In that process, important lessons of the Great Depression were unlearned and or forgotten. Around about the same time, the welfare state came to be narrowly defined, or rather redefined, in terms of redistributive economics and politics. This intellectual turnaround began in 1975 with Arthur Oaken's idea of a big trade-off between equity and efficiency, arguing that too much redistribution would harm the economy, making everybody worse off. Political scientists, on the whole agnostic on the equity efficiency trade-off, have since the 1990s come to rely on assumption of zero-sum reform politics under conditions of permanent fiscal austerity. Strikingly, this emphasis on distributive economics and politics differs significantly from the productive understanding of welfare provision held by the post-war social engineers and political thinkers. Again, Beveridge and Keynes, for Beveridge and Keynes, the modern welfare state held out a promise of full employment, admittedly only for men, comprehensive social insurance, 
and universal access to good quality health and education. When it comes to maintaining and raising employment, the active welfare states of Northern Europe did much better than their more passive and less inclusive Central and Southern European counterparts. Not suffering from an austerity panic attack, unsurprisingly, countries such as Denmark and Sweden with a strong dual earner family services bounced back without much difficulty. The Nordic experience underscores that what matters is not the quantity or ratio of social spending relative to GDP, but its composition and efficacy. And this is where I'd like to raise a second cheer in support of the so-called social investment welfare state. Over the past decade, the notion of social investment gained purchase as a policy compass for welfare state recalibration. Today, international organizations from the European Union to the OECD and the World Bank associate social investment with strategies of inclusive and sustainable growth. The objective is to enhance people's opportunities and capabilities to resolve risk typical of post-industrial economies and societies ex ante while ensuring high levels of employment necessary to sustain the carrying capacity of the welfare state, which largely relies on the number of people in employment and their productivity. Early childhood education and care, training and learning over the life course, active labor market policies, paid parental leaves, and long-term care, all these policies transcend, but do not replace, the compensatory logic post-war social security. In an attempt to overcome the unwarranted opposition between social protection and social consumption and social investment, I have developed a conception of the welfare state comprising of three functions. First, fostering lifelong development of human capital stock, Second, easing the flow of family life course and labor market transitions. And third, sustaining inclusive social protection buffers. Based on the available evidence from my European Research Council research project, WellSire, an acronym for Wellbeing Returns on Social Investment, it is possible to postulate a life course multiplier mechanism, whereby social investment returns reaped over the life course generate a positive cycle of well-being, returns in terms of employment opportunities and gender equity, with positive results on intra- and intergenerational poverty mitigation. The social investment life course multiplier features prominently in the recent report by the High Level Group on the Future of Social Protection and the Welfare State in the EU, of which I was a member. At the micro level of individuals and households, this multiplier suggests how social investments from early childhood on improve material well-being, employment and income, and help mitigate social risks later in life through opportunities for skills acquisition and the easing of gendered labor market transitions. At the macro level, the multiplier suggests a double dividend of greater and more gender balanced employment and productivity gains able to sustain adequate, fair and sustainable social protection in knowledge economies and aging societies. This indeed is worthy of a second cheer for the active welfare states. Let's move on to lesson three. Despite the growing evidential efficacy of social investment welfare provision up to the mid 2010s, fiscal austerity ruled the day at the EU level. The Eurozone crisis laid bare the shortcomings of the architecture of the internal market and the monetary union. Without a lender of last resort, 
and or a fiscal bailout instrument, it proved difficult to keep the currency union together. The original policy theory of the EMU assumed that ECB price stability mandate, together with fiscal discipline enforced by the Stability Pact, would raise pressures on member states for structural reform. After the Mediterranean economies had secured safe entry into the EMU, however, structural reform incentives waned as public borrowing became excessively cheap. Paradoxically, the euro acted as a reform tranquilizer, reducing rather than reinforcing pressures to balance the books and to make welfare policy more inclusive and capacitating. In addition, the, the Brussels Frankfurt obsession with public budgetary discipline caused Eurozone policymakers in countries like Ireland and Spain, and also my country, the Netherlands, to ignore the destabilizing effect of private sector debt accumulation. By the summer of 2012, as contagion spread from Greece to the already weakened southern periphery of the Eurozone, Mario Draghi, then president of the European Central Bank, broke the ice with his whatever it takes vow to fight rising spreads and deflation. At this place where I stand today, on the 11th of May 2018, Draghi conceded that the monetary union remained incomplete. He felt that the Eurozone needed an additional fiscal instrument to maintain macroeconomic stability during large shocks, so as not to overburden monetary policy. He conceded that such a fiscal layer would be difficult to design, consistent with the treaties. But eventually, an instrument of budgetary solidarity would have to play its part in the Eurozone. Yeah, this is not working so well, but it doesn't matter. Um, after Draghi's vow to do whatever it takes to save the Euro, a more benign economic environment ensued and unemployment began to fall. This also allowed EMU member states to expand the policy space for more capacitating and solid, solidaristic reforms. In the troubled economies of Greece and Italy, national minimum income schemes were introduced for the first time. Germany, and to some extent also France and the Netherlands, stepped up efforts to integrate excluded groups within their social protection systems. In addition, family services were expanded in many more European countries. On to lesson four. By the second half of the decade, it became obvious that the original fiscal austerity reflex was both economically flawed and politically untenable. Laszlo Andor, the Social Affairs Commissioner in the Second Brosso Commission, was the first to reopen the window for a European Union social investment welfare strategy as a promising, evidence-based corrective. However, mere lip service to social investment in combination with fiscal rectitude proved to be an incoherent cocktail. Effectively, social investment reform remained a privilege only for countries with deep fiscal pockets. Barring social investments where they were needed the most, moreover, did little to counter economic divergence within the Eurozone. There were silver linings too. The weakening of the expansionary austerity paradigm gave new impetus to social Europe. The Juncker Commission launched the European Pillar of Social Rights in 2017, setting out 20 key principles defined in terms of what I think is a fine balance between protective and social investment policies for well-functioning labor markets and welfare systems. Then COVID-19 struck. The early days of the pandemic brought back haunting memories 
from the Eurozone crisis and the migration crisis of the mid-2010s, when solidarity among member states was in high demand but short supply. Whilst the welfare state may in hindsight be hailed as the unsung hero of the Great Recession, the pandemic ushered in the unthinkable, a truly assertive reappraisal of the European welfare state. My first lesson resurfaced with real zest. Inclusive welfare state providing broad and well-organized access to sickness and unemployment benefits and to short-term working arrangement for all its citizens swiftly bounced back in good health. At the EU level, the COVID-19 policy response was surprisingly assertive and remarkably well coordinated. In March 2020, the Commission activated the general escape clause of the Stability Pact, allowing member states to depart from medium-term budgetary objectives. In April, a new quasi-automatic fiscal stabilizer called SURE was created to support member states with short-term work schemes related to the pandemic. Finally, in June, the Council reached agreement on Next Generation EU to mitigate the socio-economic consequences of the COVID-19 health shock. The, 18, the 800 billion recovery and resilience facility marks an unpre unprecedented leap in EU fiscal solidarity, paving the way for a more inclusive investment-led recovery from the pandemic. pandemic. This paid off. Employment rose and unemployment quickly fell below pre-pandemic levels. In particular, Mediterranean Eurozone economies grew admirably, with debt levels coming down much faster than after the Great Recession, precisely because of favorable growth dynamics. Overwhelmed by the truly existential COVID-19 health shock, an important political difference compared to the sovereign debt crisis was that the very nature of the pandemic could not be framed in terms of sinful debtors and virtuous creditors. It's my contention, however, that the more effective policy response to the pandemic should not be understood as simply the result of, an ace, of a symmet symmetric, this time is different, health shock compared to an asymmetric sovereign debt crisis. My argument is that, in effect, the hard lessons learned from the long decade of the Great Recession critically informed the rapid, assertive, and socially progressive COVID-19 crisis reaction. From this perspective, the pandemic conjures up the existential tipping point, but the experiential game changer was rooted in the economic, social, and political aftershocks of the Great Recession. Two cheers for the welfare state. <clears throat> Inclusive buffers are imperative, and social investment is key. Praise for ECB courage to engage in unconventional, but by now normal, monetary policy. And a final compliment for the Commission and the member states for fostering Fiscal solidarity at long last. Besieged by two major shocks, it's safe to say that adversity has strengthened the policy salience of counter-cyclical macroeconomic management, public health, poverty relief, social security, work-life balance, childhood development, and lifelong learning. Ultimately, EU fiscal solidarity, leveraged by SURE and Next Generation EU, underpinned by the normative principles of the European Pillar of Social Rights, brought into being what I sometimes call an EU holding environment where active welfare states can flourish. This is a far cry from the erstwhile EMU disciplining the environment to keep wasteful welfare states in check, as anchored in the Maastricht Treaty of 1992. Going forward, 
As always, in politics and public policies, there, is, there are many unresolved issues. Faced with high deficits and debt levels, governments will have to increase taxes to foot the bill for the COVID-19 health care and social security expansion. This against the background of Russia's inv invasion of Ukraine and related inflationary pressures and rising interest rates. Looking back, for me, most importantly, the cognitive mindsets and political orientations have been transformed in a manner that makes it difficult to turn back the clock. In addition, this re reorientation not only gathered momentum among policy elites, but also across European publics, as evidenced by the EUI YouGov survey that we have been running now for six years. When my colleague, colleague Philip Genshaw and I started our survey with YouGov in 2018, there was a marked cleavage between northern and southern member states. In the wake of Brexit, the pandemic, the Ukraine war, EU solidarity and trust in EU institutions has progressively grown stronger, and the north-south divide has subsided. This, for me, indicates that European publics have come to appreciate the more assertive crisis management style on the part of EU institutions. On the 2023 wave of the survey, my PhD student, Louis Rousseau, will shortly say some more sobering words, revealing that inflation is not good for European solidarity. Yet, overall, there is room for optimism. There is a common understanding that it's better to improve rather than to entrench welfare systems. This positive reappreciation of social policy as a formidable productive factor, I believe, should take pride of place in the debate on the future of EU fiscal and monetary governance. In essence, there is a need to agree on a stable and equitable intergenerational welfare contract that assures the well-being of the elderly in aging societies without crowding out productive resources for the young to prosper in the dynamic knowledge economy. If the principal success of mid-20th century's welfare provision was to guarantee economic security in old age, the overriding objective of 21st century welfare policy is to foster strong life chances for the young. In 2021, 19.5% of children were at risk of poverty in the EU compared to 9% of the working age population. Former EU Commissioner and Italian Prime Minister Mario Monti, never a great fan of trade unions, once called the European Union the trade union of the next generation. Well, on that score, the EU is not doing a good job. To some extent, the political conundrum is that discretionary spending on social investments is often sacrificed on the altar of popular transfers for adults and pensioners. Political cynics even maintain that as the returns on social investment only materialize in the long run, they ine inevitably clash with short-sighted electoral competition as if the long term is an oxymoron in, in, in a democracy. However, lest we invest in high quality and affordable childhood education and care, governments will soon need to tax shrinking labor forces to fund ailing pensions and healthcare systems. And at some point, young dual earner couples will, against their wishes, effectively, effectively give up starting a family. And this is already happening. So here's my proposal. I believe that there is a need for a special EU financing vehicle for public investment with a trouble-free AAA rating and strong positive knock-on effects on long-term growth and debt sustainability. If there ever was merit in having a golden rule in EU fiscal governments, early childhood investment is the no-brainer candidate. It's cheap, 
It immediately creates jobs. It directly reaches out to young families. And it's where the social investment multiplier logic is strongest. My idea for an EU childhood investment instrument should not be seen as a pro-natalist proposition to ease demographic aging, even if it does. But in terms of the normative objective for EU citizens to pursue fuller and more satisfying lives, which includes meeting fertility aspirations, our WellSire research reveals higher levels of subjective well-being in countries with good quality and affordable childhood education and care. To conclude, the notion that the EU can advance as a mere project of market integration and fiscal austerity has been abandoned. In his 1599 play, As You Like It, William Shakespeare came up with the marvelous line, sweet are the uses of adversity. Over the last 15 years, European welfare states, the EMU, and the European Union polity have had more than their fair share of adversity. As a result, we are wiser, but not sadder. Hopefully, we will no longer hear the false claim that the welfare state is a luxury which we cannot afford in hard times. Inclusive and active welfare states make European societies less unequal, their economies more dynamic, and their democracies stronger. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Professor. Very interesting, fascinating, slightly sobering presentation. A little bit later here on stage, we will, of course, have the EU Commissioner for the Economy, Paolo Gentiloni, so we will fly some of the ideas that you propose by him and see how he reacts. But thank you so much for that expert there on welfare states. See you later. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it's just 10 past 12, so we have 10 more minutes on the programme today, and this discussion focuses on whether or not EU member states are suffering from war fatigue, whether there's still solidarity there when it comes to supporting Ukrainians and the war. And for this, I'm delighted to welcome up on stage Louise Russo. He's a researcher here in Florence with the European University Institute, and he carried out this research as well with YouGov. So put your hands together now, please, for Louise Russo. Oh, I'm getting to... Oh. Good morning, everyone. Um, I will um, bring you a very brief overview of the state of play in European solidarity in 2023, so one year since the invasion of uh, Ukraine, by bringing you four main highlights uh, extracted from the, from, from the data from this year's uh, survey. Um, I should add that the data was collected just last month, so um, the data is very fresh, and I hope you find these uh, conclusions interesting. So um, I begin with, a, with, with some few words about the survey. Uh, the survey is conducted by the Solidarity in Europe research team here at AUI and YouGov, um, now also in collaboration with the Solid Research Project. Um, it has been collecting data on European solidarity every year since uh, 2018, every April. Um, back in 2018, the survey started in 11 countries, uh, represented in, in a map in, in light blue. It has since expanded into 16 EU member states and uh, the United Kingdom uh, now in 2023. And it is a remarkably large survey with um, over 24,000 respondents this year, so more or less the same size as Eurobarometer. So swiftly moving into the, can I go one slide backwards perhaps? I think it's... Thank you very much. Um, going on to the first highlight um, of the data this year, in 2023, uh, our data seems to appear that there's a certain solidarity fatigue with popular support for European solidarity understood by us as the willingness to share resources with other EU member states facing a crisis. These levels have receded to pre-Ukraine invasion levels. So they are resilient, they are in line with um, 
the data, what data has shown for the past years, but it has uh, uh, eroded somehow uh, since the spike that was registered last year with the invasion of Ukraine. So in a scale from zero to 10, um, the average willingness to support solidarity among Europeans is today 5.3, in line with, uh, as I said, was the case in previous years. Now, um, South and East EU member states represented in the map in blue on the, on the left hand are uh, in darker color. They are the more solidaristic member states and this is also in line with previous results. But also in the other hand, on the orange map uh, in the right that represents the erosion, the countries where so support for solidarity has eroded the most between last year and this year, we see that this, also, this erosion is also registered in the countries, uh, uh, in the, essentially in the Visegrad countries, the Baltics, uh, Finland and Germany, so essentially the countries where solidarity had become more popular last year as a response to the war. So this is consistent with the claim, this is consistent with the claim that the Ukrainian crisis will perhaps have a lesser staying effect than previously anticipated. In terms of the issues that elicit stronger or weaker solidarity, we have um, uh, concluded that exogenous crisis, that is, crises like uh, um, natural disasters, epidemics, military attacks, and, and climate change, elicit stronger support for, for EU solidarity, with the majority of Europeans supporting, uh, um, um, assisting other countries facing, with, facing these types of crises. They, they elicit stronger solidarity, as I was saying, than those crises that are uh, generally considered to be more uh, endogenous imbalances such as debt or unemployment crisis. Now, yet another evidence that uh, pointing to a certain solidarity fatigue is the fact that is the erosion of solidarity for countries bracing with a refugee crisis that I show in a green line uh, that has dipped below 50% again in 2023. So now there's more Europeans opposing helping other countries uh, uh, with this crisis than not. So. Uh, um, this, this is a uh, unwelcoming development. However, there are some silver linings. The first of which is that there is a positive evaluation on the part of Europeans on the EU's role as a, on the EU's role as a solidarity provider, as a crisis manager. As we see in the graph on, on the left, that there has been a slight increase in the share of respondents that when the decision to implement solidarity is taken, 70% of respondents prefer that solidarity to be channeled via EU-led instruments rather than bilaterally, so essentially supporting, trusting the EU's role as the enabler of the solidarity net. On the other hand, in the, right, in the graph on the right hand, we see that ask respondents which model of Europe would they prefer to live in, and there is a strong preference for a social European model, that is a model where the EU and national welfare states support equitable standards of living across the EU, uh, a model of Europe that takes preference over other models that we've asked, uh, so uh, uh, market Europe stressing fiscal discipline and in the, the internal market, a protective Europe uh, stressing the defense of the European way of life against external threats, and a global Europe essentially stressing the EU's diplomatic role globally. The second highlight concerns uh, uh, popular support for the EU. We see that in 2023, only 54% of Europeans would vote to remain in the EU in the event of an hypothetical membership referendum. Now, while it's still 50 over 50%, so it's still in positive terrain, this is nonetheless uh, a bit chilling and, and uh, uh, definitely a sharp decline from the 62% of respondents that would vote to stay in the EU that were registered in 2022. Now, the ongoing inflation crisis, as, as you know, has been leading to some social unrest in a number of EU countries, and this may also reflect in a certain growth in Euro skepticism. Um, after the invasion of Ukraine in 2022, the level of, the level of trust in European institutions, in the, represented by the blue line, has increased significantly, perhaps more important even on average, citizens trusted their governments. Citizens moved into trusting the EU, institu EU institutions more than their own national governments, represented by the orange line. This is still the case in 2023, but there has been an overall a general degradation in, 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 in the, in the uh, levels of trust in both European and national institutions. My third highlight, which uh, has to do with the potential reason for this erosion in trust in institutions and, and support for solidarity, has to do with the fact that by far the main concerns, the, the largest reported concern facing Europeans and their families in 2023 are rising prices, uh, represented in green line. 
Although this has always been the main issue reported in our survey uh, facing uh, Europeans, um, it became a decisively widespread uh, concern last year with the, with, with the invasion of Ukraine and soaring energy prices. Uh, now, um, this year, as every year, we've asked our respondents to identify the three main concerns facing them and their families, and 60% of our respondents identified the, the inflation and the rising costs of living. Um, this is uh, an interesting conclusion, especially because if we compare to other types of, of issues, such as a uh, uh, potential war, which are represented in the orange line, we see that it is much more important than, uh, than rising prices is much more important than for Europeans than a potential war, which has even been superseded in 2023 by concerns in terms of housing, which are on the rise. My fourth and final highlight pertains to um, perceptions concerning the Russian threat. So in 2023, the Russian threat remains sailing among European publics, for sure, but less so than a year ago, um, which may also point to a certain war fatigue in, in, in terms of public opinion. While the Ukraine invasion um, has led to a major reshift in the way in which Europeans think the EU should relate to Russia, between those who think that it should invest in more defense and security, and those who uh, uh, believe that the EU should invest more in trade and diplomacy to improve relations with Russia. Essentially, they reversed after the war in Ukraine in 2022, as you can see in the figure, but these levels have essentially leveled off in 2023. Perhaps more importantly is the fact that when we asked respondents which they thought was the biggest threat to their uh, national security, we've seen that those who responded Russian uh, power and influence, while still in the majority, represented 5% less in 2023 than last year, so essentially a descent from 36% to 31%. Um, naturally, time will tell, uh, uh, but these may point to, uh, to, uh, to a certain normalization or a certain, a certain wearing off of the effect of the war in, in public opinion and European solidarity, which may be indeed a, bit, a bitter development for European uh, for support for European solidarity. Now concluding with the main takeaways, uh, to wrap up, the first takeaway is that support for solidarity has receded somehow, but it's still resilient and, 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 and it has receded to pre-Ukraine uh, invasion levels, but it's still resilient and Europeans still support the EU as a solidarity provider, as an enable, enabler of an EU-wide safety net to ensure the European community against adversity. The second conclusion is that the EU still retains a reserve of trust among Europeans, but Euroscepticism grew during this period. The third conclusion is that EU citizens uh, are still, uh, uh, as was the case before, still primarily concerned about prices more than with the possibility of an eventual war. And the fourth highlight is that Russian influence, while still being uh, the main threat, perceived as a main threat to national security by Europeans, it is nonetheless less than one year ago. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Louise Rosa. Very insightful and interesting data there. It's just a pity that we have no more foreign ministers or members of parliament or high-level European Commission staffers here up on stage to get them to reflect to that. But a little bit later, in fact, at 1.30, I will be sitting down on stage with the Swedish foreign minister, Tobias Bilström. But now it's time to say thank you so much to Professor Antum and also to you, Louise Rosa. And thank you so much to our audience for your attention. Now it's time to have a break, have some food, stretch your legs until we meet again here at 3.30 for the afternoon session. Thank you so much. See you soon. I come from a lot of practical experiences uh, related to these issues and I thought it's time for me to take some time off to analyze the policies and look at the gaps and see how we can better campaign for change. It's always uh, interesting to meet people from other parts of the world because these are different cultures meeting, interacting and this is an experience you cannot buy. Academia is great because it helps us to, to, to find concepts to share or ideas, but practice is fundamental in peace building especially because it's something that you have to do day by day. It's not just a set of techniques, it's also a philosophy that you need to start applying. Um, I think I was also very much attracted to the fact that it's not purely academic. I'm not an academic, I've been a practitioner um, 
for the last decade. So I, I, I really appreciated the opportunity to lend my perspective from the policy space, the actual policies, uh, policy space in, in my work. I think this program is designed for someone that really knows what they want to do. And it's a thing balance. You really know what you want to do so you can come here and really look for the resources that will help you in your path. But at the same time, you need to be open-minded to reshape your idea that you have already before coming here and add new elements and come with something that is, is better than you have already planned. My name is Lotta. I'm a third year uh, doctoral researcher at the Department of Political and Social Sciences. I identify myself as a first generation academic. The EUI has a special initiative for uh, those individuals who identify themselves as first generation academics. Uh, in other words, that means that uh, they grew up uh, in families with parents or guardians who do not have a university degree. We know uh, from some studies and also from academic life in general that first generation uh, academics might face some uh, different obstacles or uh, issues, situations throughout their academic careers that they don't know how to navigate with or they might not have the uh, support to ask from their parents. So the, uh, the purpose of the initiative is uh, inclusiveness and uh, just to enhance uh, diversity within the academia and provide support networks for these first-generation researchers. So the academic services uh, facilitates uh, kind of like networks uh, or these other areas for exchange uh, through, for example, putting together peer groups or uh, they host meetings for first-generation researchers together with some uh, more senior academics and professors included. Uh, the EUI Alumni Association also provides a mentoring program for those who uh, identify as first-generation researchers. And that being said, equally, some of the professors and senior research fellows at the EUI have made themselves uh, available for individual meetings. For myself, uh, it's more of just a kind of this network I know I can rely on, I can go to people, I have contacts uh, if and when I face some uh, obstacles or issues uh, throughout my career. So it is not just for the moment while you're doing your PhD here, but of course you uh, create these uh, support and peer networks that then will last throughout your career. And I think just uh, knowing that there is such a network I can rely on, but also at the same time that uh, to see faces, okay, I'm not the only person uh, who's going through these struggles sometimes. So I think that's just in general very encouraging. Welcome to Villa La Fonte, home of the Department of Economics. This is the library here at Villa La Fonte with tasks available for, for first-year researchers on a first-time, first-year basis. Here, next door, are some of the working spaces allocated to PhD researchers in the second year now. About 70 desks across seven offices are dedicated to PhD researchers. About half of these desks are equipped with desktop computers. We are here on the terrace of Villa La Fonte, overlooking the gardens. This is a great place for lunch or a coffee. It can also be used as a workspace when you need some fresh air or for meetings. This is a place to bump into both researchers and faculty and a place to be inspired. <laughs> 